we shot that bear banger off and it didn't even flinch. Like yeah, his ears it was didn't even move. Very determined to get and across was, the rapids. And it was to still get to coming us. at us. We were on the other side of the rapids and it was like dipping and its of course, feet in like, trying to figure out where Chase it could cross. Chase has a full Sony, like big Sony out on a tripod, on a gear tripod. scattered all over the rocks. And we're trying to figure out what to do and like you know, we go get the bear banger, we come back and we fire at the bear and it doesn't do anything. It just keeps coming at us. All right, guys, we're back with another Wildfly podcast. Got my friends Chase and Amy here What's from up? Tight Loops Fly. They made it all the way from Montana. <laughs> in the little, in the little, uh, the van they've got here, little yeah. home, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Bullwinkle. What, what's the name again? Bullwinkle. 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 He's a big real moose. So, I mean, it's it's kind of a little early even for our generation, but since mm. we're about 10 years apart, like Rocky and Bullwinkle, it's a cartoon. Did you watch Rocky and Bullwinkle? I don't think it's so. It's a moose I and a myself. squirrel. The squirrel can like fly and he has like a cape and I don't know what Bullwinkle does. Anyway, the moose's name <laughs> is Bullwinkle and the way this thing looks like the brown color and the the mirrors that it used to have on it kind of looked yeah. like moose antlers also, a little bit. It's definitely he's just a fitting name. Giant and moves really slow. So. Yeah. yeah. It I'll seemed have to fitting. Get myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a classic. <laughs> yeah. I love it though. And you guys hit me up a couple weeks ago and said you're rolling into town and uh happened to be right near kind of where I went to school. So it like kind of worked out perfectly. Yeah, totally serendipitous. I was saying earlier that um we knew that we were like sort of close to where you'd be in North Carolina because we knew we'd be in the mountains, but we've never like fished anywhere in North Carolina. So we don't, until you really like dive into the geography of a region because you have a need because you're trying to explore somewhere. Kind of it's like a general area you have an idea, but we didn't really know like how close we were. And then when we started talking about where we were and where you were at, we're like, oh, we're like 20 minutes away from like yeah, the fishing super like close. To be around here. So yeah, it worked out perfect. Yeah. It was great. I mean, because we've been talking today. We got we got to fish here. Took them to a little secret spot here uh, in North Carolina. Fun little uh, small stream, but I don't know. It's That's what you think. Wait till I hotspot this yeah. on YouTube later. <laughs> yeah, dude. A little spot burn. <laughs> <laughs> Big little, uh, spot burn. <laughs> yeah, dude. Um, but it, it's so cool because it's, it's one of those things where I think you guys probably experienced this too. Like you watch somebody's videos on YouTube or mm-hmm. you see their films and then you like get to meet them in real life. You're like, Oh, these people are real. They're real people. Yeah. Like they're, yeah, yeah, totally. For sure. You know, yeah. it's, it's funny. It's fun to get to meet you guys. It's been a lot of fun today getting to hang out and definitely mm-hmm. like, um, kind of hear a little bit more about kind of how tight loops start and everything. Yeah. But I'd love to hear from you guys what it looked like. Like wh- when did this whole idea kind of start out? And when did when did you guys start uh, putting together like fly fishing films and like yeah. tight loops? Do you want to start? Or do you want me to start? You start. I feel like you you can tell the story from a different perspective. Yeah. So and also actually before I get into this, I want to touch on you're saying it's cool to like meet people in person. I feel like both of us, us being Amy and I, and then you, um, started making fly fishing videos at least that were like getting posted around enough that they're kind of like in the small scene of like internet fly fishing videos, getting like hosts on like the Orvis blog and stuff like that, mm-hmm. kind of around the same time. I mean, mm-hmm. we may be predated by like a year or something when I first saw the first like wildfly videos, but you guys were like kids. Like we were, we were still, <laughs> I remember we were, watching in, those we were videos. like your age now ish. They're cringy. You know, yeah. We're in, our, yeah. Yeah, we're <laughs> in like, no, no, no. <laughs> just, well, it's just funny because we were in like our our mid twenties or something, yeah, and you guys like were like teenagers, you know, like young teenagers. I don't know how old you were, but I assume you were like fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, like somewhere in that range, like kids, you know, like when you're Probably like once you're in your twenties, you look yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. One, okay. I mean, when, no, we were young, we were young, yeah, 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 like super small, like squeaky smaller kids, and it's just like it's funny to be now in a position where like we're all adults, and as you get older, like the age difference kind of like changes a little bit where seven eight years ten years of difference when you're that age seems like astronomical mm. you're like i'm an adult and like that's a baby over there versus yeah. now it's like <laughs> 20s versus early like same. you know mid 20s early 30s like we're basically all like the same age it's just funny to it's like watch you like grow up on video or whatever and then like here you are as like a full adult and we're, yeah. and we're like hanging like, out this is like a proud moment no, it's not like a proud moment, <laughs> but you know, it's not something yeah. like watching those videos like, oh, this is cool. Like, look at these groms who are making um, fishing videos. But it wasn't, you never think when you're watching that like 10 years from now, oh, we're going to yeah. be boys. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's just funny how it life is works weird out to that see way. Child actor over here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how it works out. 
I mean, right? Am I wrong? You guys were like really young. Yeah, I, dude, I mean, it's crazy. I'm not going to say where we are here, but um, this area in some of the yeah. stretch of the river that we passed today mm-hmm. is literally where I learned how to fly fish. Yeah. And it's it was really cool to bring you guys here because yeah. the fishing is awesome around here, just the scenery. But yeah, we literally like there are there's just a hundred yards over there. There are shots from the very yeah. first wildfire videos yeah. of us like hooking into, you know, little stocked fish yeah. and w- probably freshman, sophomore year of high school, like, yeah. looking like absolute babies. Yeah. And it's it's pretty bizarre to be like now twenty three yeah. out of college. Yeah. And uh yeah, totally. You know, this little, like, just the me carrying around a little tiny camera mm-hmm. has, like, led me to so many cool opportunities. Mm-hmm. And, like, especially yeah. meeting you guys and, like, yeah, so cool. getting to connect. I think we were talking about this today, getting to connect with different people in fly fishing and just how yeah. you just click right away. Like, there's mm-hmm. just things about it that click. And especially, like, you guys, the filmmaking and mm-hmm. the photo, I can, like, we can speak the same yeah. language. So I mean I'm definitely excited to, to get into like some of that, but let's go back to kind of like the background of tight loops and like where yeah, that yeah, yeah, kind of started. Um, yeah. So, well, I mean I've been fly fishing for I don't know over 20 years or something. I st- I started when I was 10 or a little younger or something like that. My family's from Montana, and it's kind of for most people watching this, I assume that you know that like it's in the blood in Montana. You know, kids grow up fly fishing in montana like i imagine kids grow up playing soccer in brazil or something you know it's not it's not really like not a lot of people like choose those outdoor recreations it's just like it's in the family and it's like kind of pushed on you at a young age part of the culture you know so it was kind of inevitable that i'd end up fly fishing i think um because i've got my grandparents and my uncles and cousins and tons of fly fishing family family vacations revolve around rivers and fly fishing and all that kind of stuff so i've been fly fishing forever amy had not fly fished until we met i introduced her to fly Mm -hmm. fishing um but shortly after we started dating um i was fly fishing i've kind of like weaved in and out of fly fishing i did a ton when i was younger and then when i was in college and i lived in a city that didn't have a lot of good fishing opportunities and i was skating a lot making skateboard videos i wouldn't fly fish a ton couple times a year probably i'd get out because it just like wasn't really it wasn't the environment i was in there was no one else around me who was fishing and i didn't own a car so i didn't have a lot of mobility to like get out of the city yeah Yeah, which makes a big difference anyway my life was kind of like focused on some other stuff but i was sort of reconnecting again with fly fishing in my early to mid 20s which is around the time that amy and i started dating um and so it was just something i was doing a lot and it's just kind of the natural as you're getting to know someone a little bit better start wanting to do the same things together so i invited her out go fishing a couple of times and she just like took to it super fast. Yeah, I did not really understand what fly fishing was. Like I had fished with conventional tackle when I was younger and fished salt water, but fly fishing was this weird like I get it that you're fishing, but like how does all of this work? Like <laughs> what is this thing that you're tying on the end? So it was totally new world to me and Chase took me out and then I caught my first fish, some like stocked rainbow fish, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh that was it it just like took over our lives and then yeah and it's important to understand too that at the time amy was primary mode in her life she's a vegetarian for over a decade she (laughs) had been 12 years she had been (laughs) touring and playing in hardcore punk bands which is a very a very like straight edge and like vegan and vegetarian (laughs) community (laughs) than the outdoor recreation world yeah wait for this guy oh we got polaris driving by yeah (laughs) love it um but anyway, yeah, a scene very far away from fishing. So I take that as a sign that she liked me a lot to be able to, <laughs> to even like give it a shot or whatever. But I grew up in the outdoors, though, like yeah. camping and hiking yeah. and all that kind of stuff with my family. So it wasn't like a totally new world in that way. But the fishing aspect was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the outdoor was stuff wasn't, wasn't strange for yeah. me. I, it was a conflicting thing to feel like I, I, guess a vegetarian. I was yeah, not wanting to fish and not wanting to harm these animals and then falling in love with it at the same time and finding that balance. Mm-hmm. But it's it's complicated, man. It's still complicated yeah. this day. Anyone anyone who fishes, especially in the sort of conservation-minded new angler who's very catch-and-release focused, a lot of that ethos revolves around protecting and wanting to preserve and caring a lot about wildlife but at the end of the day no one can argue that like fish wouldn't be better off if we weren't bothering them you know what i mean right. it's a double-edged sword because anglers make for great stewards and conservationists and like all this kind of stuff but on the, like on the ground level 
no fish ever benefited being caught and yeah. released. You know, it's only for the benefit of people or whatever. So yeah, it's definitely, especially for someone who's coming from like an ethical background in response to animals where like you built your life yeah. around a specific ethical framework that involved animal harm. Definitely a far cry to like get into fishing, but some people just like, just take to it. We were talking about that earlier. Yeah. Like, some people just get the bug and Amy like could cast was throwing like 30, 40 foot loops within like 20 minutes of being taught to cast fly rod. Hell for the yeah. first time. was like catching fish super fast. Just like took to it really quickly and really enjoyed it. And so then I we feel just, like it has something to do with like the musical aspect yeah there's because like it's, there's it's like some the rhythm. like an internal metronome that carries yeah. over into certain things like that but anyway we just started fishing all the time um yeah. and me having a partner because no one else i built this whole social circle in rhode island which is where i was living at the time that mostly all revolved around skating a little bit around music and a couple other scenes but mostly all around skating no one in that scene fished um for a minute, I had a buddy I was fishing with who was just like some random townie that I was introduced to from a friend of a friend. He didn't fly fish, but we went on some just like random conventional bass tackle mm-hmm. fishing trips. But all of a sudden, I had a fishing partner. So then all of a sudden, like my fishing really picked up too because we just had people who were someone else who was motivated to go fishing all the time. And um, so, yeah, as, as we're fishing all the time, an- another sort of like change in my life, I went a little... Gosh, this story is just going to be it's like, like so I feel like it's long very long. And, and yeah, <laughs> but <laughs> everything um, we talk about is long-winded. The reason I was in Rhode Island, um, which is how I ended up meeting my wife Amy, um, was I, I went to art school in Providence. Um, I ended up getting a degree in film animation and video, which is you know what I'm doing now. Even though that wasn't initially my plan when I got into college, that's mm-hmm. what I ended up doing. Um, but getting out of art school as a creative person after four years of really, really structured, regimented, you know, art school is a weird thing. Part of art is that it needs to be sort of free and unstructured and telling people like sit down and make art now is kind of like the antithesis of how art really works. So the sort of experience of like organized art education can be kind of draining. And when I got out of college I did sort of the thing you'd expect someone with a degree in filmmaking to do which is like I jumped right into the industry and started working in film and television and worked on a couple of features mostly low level stuff doing like PA work which is sort of how you start in the industry as much as you'd want to go right out of college and be like a DP or whatever it's just usually not the way yeah it works you end up you know driving people around and grabbing coffee and whatever but I spent a couple of years working in mostly reality TV couple features i was getting to the point where i was sort of crossing over and starting to do assistant editing and assistant camera and like probably would have easily transitioned into just like full-blown um industry you know film dude um but i just hated it i hated everybody i met hated everyone's sense of self-importance that was in the real you know real deal film industry it was so different from what film school was like which is just a bunch of like excited creative young people trying to make cool stuff and then you get out in the industry and it's like it's like a construction site or something no one else that I worked with on anything had been to school had any education on any of that stuff it ran kind of more like an industrial machine there wasn't really any opportunity for creativity at all um and yeah everyone was just kind of dicks um everyone so, everyone so would like, you recommend uh <clears throat> Going into the film industry? <laughs> no, I mean, you know what? I have. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Probably takes a pr- I have, certain personality. I have tons but. of peers and friends from college who continued on that trajectory and they all make great livings now. And, mm-hmm. you know, they're actual camera operators or directors. You know, they finally made it to the place you're trying to get to. I just didn't have the stomach for like all the in between work that it would take to actually get to a point where you get to make the creative decisions, you know? Mm-hmm. And really, I, I just really didn't like the people, you know? Um, it may have just been the scene in the Northeast that I was in, but everyone who was like making movies and television just thought that they were like the absolute shit, you know? Yeah. I I didn't really get that vibe. So anyway, I sort of quit out of that industry cold Turkey, um, and started working construction because a friend of mine who I skate with was building concrete skate parks at the time. And then also doing a ton of other concrete and masonry and whatever work. And I had quit my job. Well, tons of different freelance jobs in the film industry i just quit doing that stuff and was just kind of floating around he knew i was looking for something to do so i started doing that and i ended up spending like the next five years working in construction which was like really cool it was cool to learn a trade and do something different i really like the people i worked with turns out that like blue collar workers are like way cooler people to hang out with at the end of the day yeah um but 
as somebody who's really is a creative person at heart, it was like there's always going to be a time limit on that. At some point, I was just looking at it and I was like, what am I going to do this for like the next 40 years and have like concrete in my lungs and a broken back? Like, no way. I'm meant to be creating stuff. But in that period when I was just like doing that work, I wasn't doing anything creative. I wasn't drawing or painting or making videos or like anything. I wasn't making skate videos. I wasn't making nothing. I just like had been so burnt out from college and then the like year or two afterwards in the industry that I just wanted to do something completely different. But as that was changing, it was like right around the time that Amy and I started dating. And Amy was a super active artist in her own right. She wasn't like making a living off of art, but she was a creative person who was just like post college age, just super motivated and yeah, making college dropout. Yeah, college <laughs> dropout. Um, but was just like making art because she liked to make art. She's a letterpress printer and an mm-hmm. illustrator. And I just got so sparked off of meeting someone, probably the first person that I was like spending time with after college who was just like making their own art and it wasn't like because that was like the industry they needed to work in or whatever like anyway it just, doing yeah, it. it just got me like re-sparked and bought a camera because what i've been doing the most of i mean i was doing some illustration stuff which turned into some early tight loops designs and prints and stuff like that but really what i'd been doing in college for the past many years was was camera related and bought a new camera and we just were like looking for stuff to start shooting and filming we were fishing all the time and it was like well, this would be this is just like what's around us right now. We'll just document yeah. this. We're just like hungry to just like make something, you know. Um, and pretty quickly after like starting to make videos and, you know, I have a really good background in filmmaking. So like the first stuff we were making was like decent enough, you know, mm-hmm. looking back at it now, it's like super cringy or whatever and totally sucks. But <laughs> for where we were at at the time creatively, um, it all felt good and like felt like we knew what we were doing and people responded really well to it. I feel like it just kind of like evolved organically from that. You know, it's a really long way of saying like yeah. we were just fishing a lot and started shooting it. But that's sort of like the background of like what led to wanting to yeah. shoot fishing stuff. I don't think there was any I don't think the online like fishing video community was big enough yet at the time that there was any hope or sense that like we could make something out yeah. of it. It it never was a thought that it was going to become anything bigger than just you know, weekend trips and camping trips and small fishing videos. And it's kind of very quickly it it did change, but yeah, it's kind (laughs) of like they say with writers when you're like trying to fit, you know, somebody who's interested in writing, like wants to write a book and it's like, what should I write about? She's like, write what you know, you know? And what we knew at the time was like, we were just like weekend warriors who were fishing a lot. And it was like, what do we want to shoot? Well, fishing's beautiful. And like, we love shooting in the outdoors and being outdoors. So we'll just like start making fishing videos. And they're, narratively very simple just Mm -hmm. musical montage basically which i feel like is how a lot of people start it's kind of just like you find a song like oh this this would be sweet with a fishing video and you go film a bunch of clips and you put it together and you're like stoked but i think that initial like spark of like filming something especially especially something like fly fishing that you really are like you really enjoy Mm -hmm. and it's like really meaningful for you just the fishing aspect but then being able to document that and like share it with other people yeah i think people can connect to that much better than just like Mm -hmm. oh i want to go try to shoot this skit and it just sometimes seems forced it's like yeah it translates for sure it's very yeah it flows very well Mm -hmm. but like when when did you guys start uploading and like when was when did like you your, where was it that you started to upload the videos in like with the name like tight loops? Yeah, for sure Vimeo first. I'm sure Amy being as smart as she is, you were like you knew right away like we should brand this in some way. Not that it was like we need to start a brand, but I was just like I want to make videos and like post them and like Yeah, you we had, knew I you, knew we should yeah. come up with a name and like Instagram was just starting to really take off and have more of a brand presence going on. It was still like you know, before ads and all that kind of stuff. But, um, yeah, we picked tight loops, which is obviously like a pretty popular name within yeah. fly fishing. And what's funny is like, I didn't know that at the time. Cause I just like, what? I fly I, fished, I I fly fished for so long, <laughs> but I don't have my, I didn't. And I still don't really now, but more now than then I didn't have my finger on the pulse of like what yeah. the industry was doing. It was just something like I'd yeah. done with my family forever. Like, I was totally not hip to like where the scene yeah. was at. But I remember somebody had written, had written me a letter at some point or something and they'd signed it, you know, like at the end where you'd say like, take care or like best or whatever. They signed it like tight loops, so-and-so. And I remember just thinking like wishing someone tight loops was like so sick. And I was like, <laughs> 
obviously you know like what it is to like throw a tight yeah. loop or whatever. Yeah, I just I thought like, like the, the name tight loops was cool. And I was like, oh, that's sick. Like I don't hear that very often. I thought it was really unique that that person signed off a letter like that. But then after like now, if you just go on Instagram, there's like 20 yeah. other accounts that have We're like some version of magazine. yeah. yeah, There's <laughs> magazines that are like tight you loop just or a tight loop. And there's tons loops. of... It's definitely used in the industry. At the time, I thought we were being real clever, but yeah, yeah. it's kind of one of those things where, like, I guess we could rebrand, but you kind of just like you start with something and you stick with it. Yeah, you like, kind of yeah, have to stick with it. It's like yeah. pretty, pretty deep now. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's the thing is, I'm sure, like for you too, you chose Wildfly when you were like, you know, a teenager or whatever, and like, who knows what you think about it now? But like, right. it is what it is. People recognize it. They're psyched on it. You know yeah, I mean? it's an There's established. No, no point in changing. Even if you're like, wow, that came out of my like 16 year old idiot brain. Like, I, if <laughs> I started a brand today, I probably wouldn't do the same thing. You know what I mean? I but think it's, it's a like, great name. It's established. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's established. Yeah, now, yeah. Know? And y'all's works great. But yeah, yeah, you look back, you're like, Sh- would I trust a 16 year old to name my <clears throat> company? Yeah. Ah, uh, maybe. <laughs> well, and we and we call it tight loops, like just tight loops, but because we couldn't get the version on Instagram. Yeah, like you can't get that tight we dot com. And we couldn't get dot com because there's a lady who owns it who's not using it. Yeah. Um who wants it. She's a casting instructor. And she just so wants it. Obviously for it works something yeah. in the future. It works yeah. for her business, but she wouldn't sell it to us for any amount of money and we wanted it so bad we're like, this is so important to us. This is this is gonna be the website <laughs> for the like, brand. Please. No. Right. She's like, no. She's like some casting instructor. And in also K-Pop. like on Facebook there's someone with the name Tight Loop, so like we can't name our business page Tight Loops, like with the the oh, address like right. we still have like the weird yeah. number thing for our facebook page nice. but no no one uses facebook yeah. anymore yeah. i've kind of yeah. given Whatever. up on facebook <laughs> oh yeah let's do maybe if we get super famous at some point we'll have enough clout that like <laughs> we can like verify just, like, like yeah, muscle, yeah, muscle it away from other <laughs> yeah. people but anyway so we had to call it's it worked out fine so far we had to call it if you had to put an extra word on it like fly is the only thing that makes sense yeah. um but most people just call us tight loops fly like no one really calls us tight loops even though like our logo and everything mm-hmm. is just tight just loops without tight the fly, loops. but it's kind of become tight loops fly, which like grammatically doesn't really make any sense. Doesn't have to. Yeah, it's, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, it's got good name recognition, yeah. I guess, yeah. with people, so it doesn't really matter. Well, it's good. Uh, so I, I think the first film that I saw from you guys was that like, I think it was Journey On, mm-hmm. right? The big Montana trip. Yeah. That is just, it's like, what, 30, 40 minute, like pretty long film. It's I think it's like 50 something. Maybe, yeah, maybe it's really? 50 minutes. Yeah. I haven't like watched f- it in a while. Yeah, <laughs> to be honest, <laughs> it's a full remember. blown yeah. deal. But mm-hmm. I I remember just I don't know when I saw it, but being on YouTube and like mm-hmm. it just popped up one day, and I was like, oh, I'll watch this. Yeah, and you know at the time there was like some fly fishing videos on mm-hmm. YouTube, but it wasn't really there wasn't really much going on. But I remember just yeah. watching it and be like, oh my gosh. Yeah. Like, who are these guys that are just like, this is so sick. You were like riding on a motorcycle. I'm like, what? This is sick. And you guys are going through Montana. But what was uh, what was kind of like the motivation with that that first big film? And like, tell me kind of how that played out when you uh, when you posted it. You want to start? I was going to let you take it. It's up to you. I could take it. Yeah, you go. Well, so we knew, we just bought this van. Um, also Amy's great idea. Yeah, I was like pretty hell bent on buying one of these vans, which maybe to be a detriment. We always had old (laughs) Volkswagen. My daily driver was a Volkswagen Cabriolet, a little convertible. Um, And I had a 96 Volkswagen Golf, but we both were obsessed with old boxy Volkswagens. So we were were into the general scene, but Amy suggested that we had to get one of these vans. I didn't really get it at the time. He was like, we should just get a pickup truck and like put a bed in the back. And I was like, but these vans, look at how cool they are. Like it's a Volkswagen. It's adorable. Let's get one. Yeah. I mean, I think we really wanted to travel more. I was working in construction. I was very unhappy getting to the point where I was very unhappy doing it and wanted to, because as I was saying earlier, as we started to get sparked on doing more creative stuff, all of a sudden this like fun, like salt of the earth, nine to five job I'd been working was like getting in the way of doing the creative stuff we wanted to do. It was just like super tired at the end of the day, every day. Mm -hmm. We're just like squeezing what we wanted to do in the margins on the weekend. Yeah. We're leaving like Friday night to like drive as fast as we can up to some campground out in western mass and then fish on saturday and sunday and drive like it's just we were totally burnt out and yeah Yeah. so we we knew we wanted to just like figure out a way to travel more and just do like if nothing else do like a really long trip and i think probably when we started out we're like we'll just go as long as we have money and like turns out that's like about the length of a summer we thought and also i had never been to montana i had never seen yellowstone Mm -hmm. i'd never been out west other than like a trip to san francisco before I met Chase, 
but I flew there and I flew back. So I hadn't experienced much of the country and I hadn't seen any of the West and I hadn't seen the national parks and I had definitely not fly fished in any of those places. So, yeah, so that was, that, that was, was a, a huge thing. motivation yeah. and Chase really wanted to show that to me for the first time. I grew up fishing all that kind of stuff, but as somebody who's like new to fly fishing, mm-hmm. no matter where you start at some point, the pinnacle is always going to be like, I got to go to Montana. I yeah. got to see like the most yeah. famous rivers in the United States. You know what I mean? I got it. We got to get to those types Montana of Montana people are like, no, yeah. <laughs> no <home. laughs> um, don't say that. <laughs> so yeah, there's definitely a, a huge motivation. Like I really wanted to show that part of the country to Amy, um, do a big road trip like that. And I was making good enough money working construction. It was hardly like any serious living but for someone in your early 20s who like all i bought was like beer and gas station sandwiches it felt (laughs) like like we were able to save enough money where we're like we can buy this van and then have like you know yeah four or five grand to like like, live as long as we can on and just like live on the road Uh, yeah which like i said as it turns out lasts about three months um but so we just really wanted to do the trip and being filmmakers and creative people we knew we wanted to try and document it somehow and we wanted to do it to a standard that, you know, we wanted, we're trying to make movies. Well, you yeah. Know, was yeah. The idea. I also had like a crazy idea to document all of it in film because at that point yeah. I was still pretty stubborn about not shooting digital uh, and wanted to be able to develop film on the road, which was kind of a nightmare. But, but you did. <laughs> we did it. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, the, the was... trip was going to be more expensive than your average. Let's like, just throw some stuff in the car and go. We had lofty ideas about like what we wanted to do from the media side. Um, so we ended up running a, a Kickstarter campaign with a, a lot of lofty rewards on top of the feature film that we ended up making. Amy was going to make a photo book and we had all sorts of photo prints to give people, you know, lots of different rewards to sort of motivate people to, to donate, to help us along on this trip. Um, and, we were successful in that Kickstarter campaign, but only after like we funded a third of it. Yeah. Kickstarter is <laughs> an did. all or nothing campaign. So if you don't hit your goal and our goal was 10 grand and our minds were like, if we, we had 10 grand, we're we like, made, we can make like a Hollywood movie. Which yeah. Is yeah. Now, like but, almost 7,000. Right. Yeah. We made like, and then we funded the rest. Uh, we were able to, yeah. Raise like which, six or seven. And then we had, you know, like I said, we had like four grand at the time. We just like pumped our three grand into it to make sure it was pushed over the finish line so that we would be able to receive the other funds. Cause if you don't reach your goal on Kickstarter, all the money just goes back to the people's accounts. Right. That it was on hold. Yeah. I don't think GoFundMe so. was like even invented at that point. So you guys did one for that Montana, the initial mm-hmm. Montana. Yep, that was our first And that was Kickstarter before you had campaign. any sort of audience. Yeah. Like yeah. it was just, basically, it was super scary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and basically as you tell people, if I was if I was going to tell someone who was like asking about running a Kickstarter campaign, like most of your network going into it is going to be like your own friends and family, um, yeah, especially sure. if you're not like a notable brand with a serious audience. So like, it was really cool. Like we we're able to raise money, and there's tons of like random generous people who were just like interested in seeing what we were going to do. But like, what it comes down to is like most of the money is like our friends and family who like you could just like privately go and ask like, hey, yeah. can you throw us a couple bucks? We're trying to do this thing. We've done it that way. Instead, we did it in this like big public forum. Um, but yeah, so I we consider it a successful Kickstarter campaign. But in reality, behind the scenes, like we weren't actually able to raise ten thousand mm-hmm. um, dollars. But we're still, you know able to raise enough that amy could like buy a nice new rangefinder film camera and like and a lot of film you know one to two grand (laughs) worth of like film to be able to shoot and do all this cool stuff i mean that's really the story of how it came together once once we're at that point we're fully committed we just made it happen um Mm -hmm. yeah and it was cool when you were telling me earlier i'd I'd like to it'd be cool for you to talk about it on the podcast but just when you guys initially posted that video mm-hmm. and cause you guys had what, like 80 subscribers at the time. Yeah. So it wasn't, I don't think when we shot it in 2015, 15. um, I think it probably made it to YouTube in 2016 or something. But in 2015, when we shot it, I don't think we were on, maybe we were on YouTube. I, we I want to say we weren't even on YouTube yet. I it definitely think wasn't we a thought that like hmm. YouTube, we were mostly on Vimeo and I didn't think that YouTube would be like a serious platform 
that we would like aim for. Like, I don't think that was part of the like Kickstarter campaign was like the film will end up on YouTube. Like, I think we sold it for a minute to try and make some money back on the back end on Vimeo on demand, which like we really didn't yeah, make. Yeah, I think we made like a yeah. few hundred dollars. Yeah, really didn't make any money <laughs> doing that, which was fine in the end. I mean, well, we came back super broke, but yeah. Like, the, the like film, every trip out. Yeah, I just go back to your job. <laughs> yeah. Every film, road trip. <laughs> the film was paid for by fans and audience, so at the end of the day, it's not a big deal that we weren't able to, like, make more money off of additional audience afterwards. It's kind of already paid for up front. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, when, by the time we were, I was done editing the film, I think we had started to upload some of our earlier videos to YouTube, um, but we had a super small following. Yeah, it was like... 80 subs, 100 subs, something like that. I don't think any of our videos had more than a couple hundred views of the couple that were up there. But we threw that video up there once we pulled it off of the crowdfund or the uh, paywall platform, on demand platform on Vimeo. And it kind of sat there and did nothing for four or five months. Gained a couple hundred views. Um, I'm sure some of the people who were part of the Kickstarter campaign shared it around once. You know their friends and family who didn't donate to the campaign were able to watch it because part, part of the out on. yeah part of the reward of donating to the campaign was people got you know copies of it when we first released it, but then all of a sudden having done nothing at all it just like caught some sort of you know in our world viral spark which isn't you know it's a couple hundred thousand views but for us is you know about as viral as it gets and just overnight just like started rolling in just like tons of comments into our email and. Yeah, by the time a month had passed from when that spark hit, it was like up over 150,000 views and we gained a couple thousand subs. And I say that's really the start of everything. I mean, we still, to this day, at least once a week, get an email, someone talking about how that video changed something for them, you know, convinced yeah. them to want to go on the road or get into fly fishing or whatever. That That one seems really impactful to people. And I think it's probably because the film, which is intentional, this is was kind of our like our thesis for the project was like we're just like average folks working shitty dead end jobs mm-hmm. who really want to go on an adventure and like this is the biggest adventure we can muster. So like here it is and like you could do it too if you want it bad enough. So like I think there's something really honest about that film that as we do this more and more, the adventures inevitably get bigger and bigger. Um and eventually they'll get to a point where they're like out of reach for the average person, right. you know, cause you start to get brands behind it and funding behind it. And it's like, Oh cool. We can go on like an exotic adventure now, but people watching it while well, it's super fun to watch, they're not, not like accessible. that could be me in a mm-hmm. month if I save my money, you know, cause mm-hmm. it, it starts to become inaccessible. But that film in particular was just like, fuck it. We quit our jobs and we just like, got in a van and drove out west and spent all summer doing nothing but fishing because like that's what we wanted to do and like guess what we're broke afterwards but like who cares and i think people really relate to that because like for anyone who's interested in anything like this even if they're saddled down in a way where they can't do it right now everyone wants to do something like that and i think most people don't because they're just scared um and i don't want to minimize people's um burdens in life some people literally can't yeah health issues or kids or money you know whatever there's there's legitimate excuses for why you can't just drop everything and go fishing all summer but i think a lot of people could and they're just scared of the consequences of like i can't just like leave my life behind yeah for three months but the truth is like a lot of people probably could and you just kind of gotta like get after it and so i think that video is like lots of people live vicariously through it and a lot of people get inspired and end up doing it after that video so i think that one more than probably any other one is like really impacted people in like a meaningful way yeah i I think that's like the power of like the film that you they're like just filmmaking in general especially um now being able to share on youtube and being able to connect with an audience Mm -hmm. of people and like reach people and they like watch something they might not even they have no idea who you guys actually are yeah but they're like these two guys are they just quit their jobs they're like i've always wanted to do this but they're doing it like they're actually doing it yeah um yeah, I think there's something like inspirational about that. Um yeah. to kind of to kind of get hopefully it doesn't even have to be like a huge trip, it could be a weekend trip. Yeah. You know, get them to get out and um yeah, and go fish. Cuz that's always the, I mean, that's the kind of stuff that I want to watch. Um I mean, there's always I don't want to take anything away from like the super 
far flung exotic expedition films that like if you go to the fishing film tours it's like all you see you know is these like really elaborate adventures that are totally out of reach for anyone it's really fun to fantasize mm -hmm. about that kind of stuff it's fun to watch in the same way that going mm -hmm. to see a hollywood film about some you know italian bank heist something will never happen in your life <laughs> it's still entertaining to watch and kind of fantasize about like oh what, what would i do in that situation type of thing but the stuff i really like to watch is the stuff where like you can actually insert yourself into it and see yourself for real like doing that kind mm -hmm. of thing and yeah that that first first sort of like travel film is probably the most accessible of like that any of our films will ever be because like i said as we yeah. get more successful at this stuff by its nature we'll have opportunities that are still accessible to anyone else you just have to put in the a lot of work decade of work in front of it to like get to that point you know but yeah so like with with your films a lot of them have they tell what i've noticed is they tell a very good story it's like very well thought out like the voiceovers are very clean and they fit very well with the films and um i'm curious what it looks like from like a pre-production standpoint on your your films to like how do you like set up you know kind of like like i guess like going into a video like you have an idea like how do you how do you kind of set that idea up so then you can again or go and execute um it to the best of its ability or your ability well first thank you appreciate the, the compliment yeah um gosh man it's a little bit different with each of them and we're obviously like always refining it um to some degree but it usually just starts with a semi-planned but mostly unplanned idea of like something we'd like to do and we're very visual people so like oftentimes a lot of it is sort of based around these like visual fantasies we have about like how something's gonna look you know it's like maybe for journey on we're thinking about that film and it's just kind of like van on the road and you're going through these images of like open landscapes and like whatever you know you sort of start to like rivers and fish and like you've got these sort of like visual beats that you're trying to hit that you think are maybe like evocative of a certain thing and then you sort of get into it in real life you're actually on that trip and you're sort of looking for those moments and you're getting those moments and then it starts to sort of piece itself together a little bit in between but I don't know that like I don't think we plan the narrative too much in advance. Mm -hmm. A lot of it's pretty organic. I mean, you have a loose idea. We're going to go to this place and do this thing. But part of what I think we love about the stuff that we do is that it's kind of uncontrollable and unpredictable, especially dealing with yeah. wild animals and nature and <laughs> all that kind of stuff. Yeah, you never know what's going to happen. Yeah, so for sure, the the trip or the project kind of ends up what it's going to be anyway no matter you yeah. like it or not yeah. you yeah. get the you story get what is you actively get. but there's a loose guide we're... yeah there's a loose guideline that's sort of guiding us towards certain things or yeah. places or whatever to begin with because you're sort of you have an idea of what you'd hope would happen but you just can't control what's going to happen so a lot of that a lot of what ends up being the story is like sitting on the events for a long time afterwards and just sort of like contemplating what's happened and mulling it over and trying to pick out that narrative after the fact yeah, yeah. Um, but i think some of the best stories come from the unpredictable circumstances yeah. you know like big land like things not going how we expected them to go it was a different story than we thought we were going to tell but i think it just became more interesting it would be a very different film if we just showed up and it was gangbusters yeah the whole like time you, yeah and yeah. we all caught fish until we were tired of catching fish and then we just flew home right you know yeah. it's but always that's what a little bit more fun to like suffer and work for it and so and you know yeah. like in the it, moment it like, makes oh, a better story yeah better. like it's hard in the in the moment but to persevere yeah. through that too i think is what is inspiring for a lot of people yeah mm -hmm. so i think like for with that example probably the idea that we had going into it was like this will be a story about place you know the mm -hmm. fishing's incredible and it's incredible because it's pristine and it's pristine because no one's there and like that's the story of people trying to get to somewhere so far removed um and it's just assumed that the fishing will be great when we get there and like that's an interesting story anyway to just sort of talk about the disappearance of our truly wild landscapes and how if you work really hard you can still briefly sort of touch those places but they might not be around for long but right. they're around now and like 
here's what they look like. This is what everything used to be like, you know, like mm-hmm. that's, that's the story or whatever. Um, but the story ended up being a lot more than that. And it had a lot more of like the perseverance and the struggle and the overcome on the human aspect of it that wasn't planned to begin yeah. with, but in the end ends up making a better film. It's not always going to work that way. Sometimes something might make a much worse film than it was going <laughs> to be. But I yeah. think the nature of, we're people who are just like really passionate about nature and the outdoors. And I think that there's just so much magic and drama that just exists in wild spaces that if you're like attuned to that kind of stuff, it sort of writes itself. Yeah. Um, Yeah. If you can't find a compelling story to tell about natural and wild spaces, you're just like not paying attention. I'm sure you'll know this. I'm sure this just like shows up in your YouTube feed also in general, just from watching there's, there's like a whole ecosystem of people who are just like so desperate to watch anyone do anything outside. Yeah. We're so divorced from what used to be really natural process for humans that like, there's this whole ecosystem of like million sub channels of people who just like, make traditional fire using sticks or I, yeah i've you seen know, those. like survival stuff and like i think we're all still it's so recent in human history that we're living in urban space and and not spending as much time outside and for us we still spend a lot of time outside but i think mm-hmm. there's this like compulsion for people to want to be outside more even though we've built a world where most people can't spend a lot of time outside so yeah for us as filmmakers you don't have to do a lot, I guess, to make something that people are just like hungry to see anyway. Cause everyone, even if it's not the way they've grown up and maybe they don't have, I, I've met very few people who like have no interest in being outside or like mm-hmm. wouldn't like to fancy themselves adventurers in some way or someone who could like hack it out in the woods, at least especially within like the world that we're making of like fishing films and whatever. Maybe there's some people who are like, yeah. I don't like bugs and I don't, you know, I don't want to be out there. And <laughs> I don't want to be. Yeah. But yeah. It's, it comes probably like from where they've been raised. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. But yeah, I think one of the things with like what we do in the films that we both produce, it's like you're doing an activity that you rely on a fish mm-hmm. to eat something. Yeah. But you don't, you, it's not planned. Right. Yeah. And like trips are never planned. Like that's, that is like the draw to fishing. Yeah. It's the uncertainty side of it. It's like, what's going to happen on this trip. Yeah. And so it's very hard to plan, you know, like what the story is ahead of time, obviously mm-hmm. like you can plan stru- like structure yeah. out like, Oh, here's what the trip is going to look like maybe. Mm-hmm. But then you kind of document and get those like really cool uncut moments um, yeah. that happen. Yeah. But like once you guys shoot something, I'm curious what it looks like when you go into yeah. that like next stage of the production, it's like, you've got this huge project shot yeah. and it's like, how do I format that into a story? Yeah. I'd say basically it would start by like arranging all the footage chronologically in a timeline to sort of, cause usually what happens after a big trip like this is like, we just don't touch anything for like months. We just like <laughs> sit with what happened and just sort of think about it and whatever. And then eventually it's like, all right, we got to actually like make this film come to life or yeah. whatever. So the first thing to do is just like call all the footage into a timeline and sort of arrange it chronologically and just sort of like rewatch it and relive it once we've had a little bit of time away from it and it's sort of fresh again, you know, to sort of see everything um, that had happened and sort of take stock of it. And then from there, once it's arranged, I'll start writing. And currently the way most of our like personal films, sort of like tight loops films about our personal adventures are very voiceover heavy. Like that's the main narrative tool Mm -hmm. that's used is is my voiceover. Um, And I write that voiceover after sort of watching all that stuff back. I'll sort of visually watch it and then I'll step away again and just sort of internalize it and just start sort of like rearranging, messing around with that story in my head, kind of writing, writing without writing for a little while and then I'll start writing it out. And once it's written out in voiceover, I'll record that. And then that voiceover basically becomes like, that's the script. So like that goes into a timeline and then it's like, pick the images that need to go with this. And there's a little bit of like back and forth. We're like, okay, this doesn't really work. I need to write something different Mm -hmm. and like adjust this or that. But like the hardest, the, the biggest creative decisions all come in just the like writing at my laptop, writing the voiceover. That's where like the real narrative, um, work is done. And you have a little bit of creativity in that where you can kind of like 
push and pull and go here and there. But for the most part, it's sort of driven by what you know you have on camera and what yeah. you can get coverage for. Um, kind of drives the story. Like yeah. that's the, especially when it's like the films that you guys have, yeah. it, it's like the core element that's like yeah. bringing the audience along, letting them know like what's happening. Mm-hmm. And then you you overlay that with like, yeah. footage. But once obviously. once that voiceover is written, it's almost like don't have to think anymore about it's like paint by numbers at that point. It's like I'm guided by the voiceover. Like <laughs> this voiceover, voices. whoever wrote it, even though it's like you know, it's I've wrote it's like somebody else wrote it or whatever and like I'm editing yeah, for somebody else. It's a little else, bit easier you know I mean? to just like, like I don't have to think of, a... yeah, I don't have to think about where we're going, I know where we're going. Yeah. But um, yeah, sometimes it takes you a while to get the voiceover stuff ready in your head and then the actual recording of it doesn't take that long because you've like had so much time with it i'm not i'm not by any means like a great writer but i'm a pretty competent writer and i'm a published author like i'll i'll write freelance for magazines and publications and i'd say you're a good writer i thanks i think he's a good writer too i I make him write everything (laughs) It's, it's not it's not something i've like set out to do but it's something i always took to pretty well in high school Mm -hmm. pretty good at writing do you read a good bit no, did you grow up I don't. Because I'm super dyslexic, and it's honestly kind of a chore for me to read. I'm the type of person who has to like, not like I'm like I can't read, but like I I'm looking at certain paragraphs. I'll have to reread them like three or four times just to like audiobooks though. We started a little bit. We a ton of podcasts, but I, yeah, yeah, he yeah he listens to podcasts nonstop. But we listened to one audiobook. We never finished it. Yeah, but yeah. It's just it's tricky. Yeah, not, like, as, not as well read as you might assume by somebody who like writes in a certain way. You'd think I'd be mm-hmm. better read, but I'm still well read. Well, yeah, no, like, it's just not in book format. Yeah, it's it, like plenty of other articles yeah. and that's true. Other that's, formats. I guess that's, that yeah, he's that's hard for my attention to sit down and like because I read slow to start and finish a book. Some people will read a book in a weekend or whatever. Mm-hmm. It takes me. Months yeah, you've had to the same book. book in the van since we got on the road. Gosh, there you go. Then yeah. he started reading before we got on the road, and it's still not <laughs> so done. Yeah, so I'm, like a, I'm, I'm not like much that. better either, but <laughs> I'm like a little bit faster reader. I'm like a book a year, like barely. Yeah, but yeah, that that's really the way it goes. Is like. And we that don't may make change. a ton of time for ourselves to just have downtime to read, which I think is something I would like to change a little bit mm-hmm. yeah. going forward. We're usually like kind of nonstop, but hopefully in the future, yeah, a little more downtime. I think it's good. I think it, unoccupied by like what feels like tasks we have to do. Right. Yeah. So like, how do you guys? How do you record your voiceovers? I'm curious because. <laughs> It's kind yeah. of funny. I've I've heard <laughs> I've done different things. I'd like to hear how yeah. you do it. Um, well, well, it has like I feel like it has many li- like different phases because yeah. we were in the apartment at first, so we <laughs> had a space and a closet, and then like it has changed quite drastically since moving into the van. But obviously, you're the the expert with your setup. <laughs> yeah, I mean, when it started. Um, Probably for like journey on. That's the first thing I think I did voiceover on. Um, I was just using the shotgun mic that came with the camera. Um, but I built out my brother is a musician. He's got a PhD in music. Um, so I was around music production and like audio production a lot of my life. He's my older brother. Um, so I knew right away before ever recording any piece of voiceover, like I knew how important it was to have like a dead room you know, a sound insulated room and like a decent mic, you know, the shotgun mic isn't really meant for close up voice work like that, but it's good enough. It's better than a lot of microphones. Um, so I knew how important that was. So like step one was like fully built out like a closet recording space, you know, with like foam on all the walls and covered in blankets. He like barely fit in it. It was just the perfect shape (laughs) that he could sit with his head (laughs) up and then his feet out. So yeah, do do my absolute best to make like as close to a sound recording booth as possible. And also like I would need to leave the premises. No touching doorknobs. Yeah. No walking. No noises. Yeah, we lived in <laughs> like, like an, really telegraphs throughout the apartment. Yeah, yeah, we lived in an old house that had like creaky floors and yeah. stuff like mm-hmm. that. So, um, but yeah, I think that goes a long, a long way. But more than even like you could have a semi crappy mic, but if you get a good environment to record on it, it'll sound like a much better mic than it is. Um, right. So yeah, like prepping the space for it is 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 key. And everything since then has just been like an evolution of that. It slowly started buying cardioid microphones which are meant for the voice that you would use for singing or voiceover or whatever getting more specialized mics that are are meant for that application and just sort of honing in 
better spaces, but it's always basically just been like today's voiceover day, whatever room we're choosing for voiceover gets like a full (laughs) overhaul. And we used to have in our basement a ton of like, you know, milk carton style foam, tape that stuff up all over the place, like build a little fort out of blankets and like get under the blankets and like have your paper set up and your microphone and some hot tea or something for your voice and just like go go at it for a day or two. And uh, I've gotten a lot better at it um, in that when I first started, I would do like every single page of voiceover like seven times in a row and then like go through and pick out with each sentence, each paragraph, like which delivery I like the best. Yeah. Which in the end just ends up being too much. I'm getting better at just Just like nailing it in one or two times through and just having like a couple options. And also it's, it's a weird thing voiceover, you know, you always assume that you're putting pretty natural and good inflection into stuff but i go back and watch the old stuff now and it's like who is this guy speaking on this voiceover like it just sounds <laughs> so bad you know what i mean there's no emotion in it no energy whatever that's something you get better at doing it's really weird as soon as you start reading off of a page how just like weird even if it's something you wrote and yeah, you know, yeah how up and down, different it you just delivered. say it really differently so that's like a skill that's taken a long time to learn and i'm still suck at it. i'm doing tons of voiceover for this new series we're working on and it's getting better and better but still a long ways off from being like the type of voiceover that like you look up to that you see in a certain <laughs> movie or a TV show or something where you're like, oh, this person just sounds like super great, super conversational, but also it's like really well written, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm always curious to hear cause like I used to do, like I used to like make a little kind of booth in my mm-hmm. closet and I record it from like a microphone mm-hmm. and then go dump it in. And then it's like you listen to it back. You're like, oh shoot, I didn't like that. And you go back and like yeah. re-record it. But recently, I've gotten like a USB mic that yeah. I plug in, so I can record straight to Premiere. Yeah. That um, and so I can like literally, if something even is a thought in my head, I can record it. If yeah. it's even an idea, I'm like, oh, I should do, I should add this title here and do this. I like oh, record cool. that. Yeah. And then it's on my timeline, so I can go back yeah. and like I'll highlight it like a color mm-hmm. or something. But yeah, I was curious if you guys had ever or had switched over to doing any usb like directly into premiere i i had a usb interface but it was noisy there like noise floor level noisy there was like feedback in it that Mm -hmm. i couldn't resolve um no matter what i did somewhere in the xlr or the microphone i think it was really in the usb interface because i continued to use that microphone afterwards um with better effect but right now because um and I guess we didn't have this when we were in our apartment either, but now that we're in the van and like space is such a, at such a premium, you kind of have to limit how much gear you have and like a full audio deck, um, like a real serious sort of like mixer recorder that you'd see on a movie set or something that's sort of, you know, the size of a VCR or yeah, something like yeah. that with a bunch of inputs just isn't really something that's like, it's not another piece of gear that we need. So I do voiceover, have a pretty nice, um, mic, but I XLR input it directly into the FS700, which has pretty good preamps in it. Okay. Surprisingly good preamps. Yeah, yeah. Um, Much better than some of the cheaper options that you'd buy in like a kit or something that comes with a microphone or whatever. And so I record them to video files on the FS700, and then I extract the audio later right. in Premiere. So you guys working together as like a couple, so you have kind of like this working relationship, and then you also have like this like intimate relationship being married like how are you guys able to balance that and how does it look like responsibility wise when for like a production for you both you guys Mm -hmm. yeah i I feel like i don't know it kind of like flows together Mm -hmm. it doesn't feel like super separate as far as like a working relationship but chase does all the editing color grading sound design voiceover stuff unless like he needs me to do voiceover or something but yeah um i've done very little voiceover but as far as like a production type thing i will do like b camera stuff i'll we film together but i'd say most of the post-production stuff is all on his shoulders and and he's like the primary filmer too so like the majority of it is on his end. But. Yeah, the, the way it works really is like Amy's primary stills photo, I'm primary video, and we kind of supplement each other back and forth. Occasionally yeah. I'll shoot a couple photos here and there. She'll shoot B cam on most of the stuff we film. Um, lately, Amy's definitely taken like sort of like an administrative role yeah, in a lot I've of the projects. Yeah, I've been doing a lot more of like 
emailing financial stuff like organizing I'm, and yeah i'm such a flake that i'm just like i just want i just want to <laughs> yeah. focus on the video i don't have to think like, yeah. about anything a else a lot of you phone know? calls with and these with projects and yeah these projects and, are big and complicated and there's lots yeah. of stuff we're just to do so trying to get to a point where we're a little bit more stable and financially stable and able to continue to make things that we love and just try just seeing what that looks like going forward so mm -hmm. Because so much is on his shoulders with this kind of stuff, with any film or series that we're making, I just f try to do whatever I can to. Yeah. To f I mean, it's yes and no, it. but it's also like, you know, all the content you see on Instagram, like, that's all Amy because it's all photos. And like, okay, all yeah. the content you see on YouTube is like me. And like, sometimes the, the videos are more complicated in a lot of yeah. ways, but. It's not. It's not like I carry all the weight or whatever. But you probably like have like, oh, Amy, like I got this idea. Like, what do you think? And like, yeah. run it by her. Yeah. Oh, you should change oh, this thing. Oh, for sure. Thing, and it's, funny. it's so hard. It's for funny. Me. <laughs> it's funny because I don't have the like art school. I'm. I am a college dropout, as we've discussed. But I don't have like the art school pedigree with, with like critiquing pieces, and it is very frustrating for him. I don't know how to talk about. I'm. I'm things used like to. That. Yeah, because where I come from is sort of like a classically trained filmmaker. A big part of anyone who went to film school would know is like critique where you make a work and you show it to your peers and everyone sits down and just talks about everything that's working and not working in that piece in not like special language, but a, a, like a, an, a filmically educated language that is sort of universally or commonly understood amongst everyone and everyone sort of sp speaks the same, the same language and they can communicate fluidly between each other about what's working, what's not working and things that are oftentimes hard to articulate in simple language. Right. About, well, this, you know, little beat here in this piece didn't like, yeah. didn't feel quite right. And why it didn't feel quite right is maybe a little complicated yeah. to explain <laughs> why, it, oh, that, well that hung for an extra second right. longer than what should have felt right. And, you know, maybe that for somebody who hasn't, talked about stuff like that it's kind of complicated yeah, I'll, to articulate I will, like, why something feel like something is off or not working but i don't know how exactly yeah. to explain that and like this is always the example we use because we do get asked about this every once in a while but one time chase had asked me to come into the studio and and look at some stuff he had put together and i was watching it and like oh everything looks great and then we got to this one point and i laughed like out loud it was yeah. not it wasn't a funny it moment. wasn't a funny moment and he was like <laughs> why did you laugh and i was like well i just thought this was funny and like he you're, was you were like i don't know like it's just not funny. happy you're about like, my inability wrong? to explain like yeah. why it was funny to me but it did not make the final but, cut <laughs> yeah, it got pulled that's, yeah that's the moral of the story is i made an yeah. adjustment and it was better afterwards amy has impeccable taste um with everything um <laughs> great i mean great you know Fashion sense, great aesthetic taste, great photographic taste, great, you know, I trust her opinion above anyone, even if we don't have like the common language to express why something's working or not. I always show stuff to her. And even if I'm like frustrated or embarrassed <laughs> when I show something and she like doesn't like it in some way and can't tell me why she doesn't like it and that's not helpful in the moment, like I know that thing needs to change because like Amy's always right. You know yeah. what I mean? Like I'm working I'm working on it. And it's and that's trying like to the, give better feedback. <laughs> that's the reason you like show stuff to other people too, because like as much as it's helpful to sort of be in a creative bubble and you can like really go wild and express yourself and feel like safe to just like do whatever and maybe get a little like wild and creative with something, when you're in that bubble you can get a little lost. Because at the end of the day, what we're making is intended for an audience and like it doesn't matter what I think some the impact of some scene is or whatever if the audience doesn't feel that then it's not working right so like amy's just like the perfect audience you know we're like i can run it by her and like it's kind of true of maybe it's more helpful that it's like an audience we're like an audience member a random isn't audience person might not be like able to explain <laughs> why they thought that was funny either but it just yeah. doesn't hit right yeah. and i just know that i gotta like figure out how to fix it you know it's probably like the perfectionism in you yeah. to like because you like in the in the like producer role or filmmaker role, like you see things differently than the audience, mm -hmm. right? And so like I show stuff to my parents or my brother, you know, or a friend, like have them come over, like, hey, just like let me know what you think about this. And just like yeah. I think it's good to get an outside opinion who mm -hmm. someone who hasn't been looking at the same ten second sequence for mm -hmm. like yeah. fifty times in a row. Yeah. To be like, Oh no, it looks good. You're like, Oh, really? I've been stuck on it like for 
an hour, you know? Yeah. And so it kind of helps you to, it's like, it, you're like, okay, it's good enough. Like I should move on to the next part, but mm-hmm. it's also good to get an opinion from yeah. an outside source. Yeah. My instinct is usually to be like with anyone, you know, like if I'm convinced <laughs> something's really good that I've made something really good and I show it and like people don't think it's that great or whatever. I'm like, ah, you don't get it. You know, yeah. you, know? you just <laughs> you don't, don't get, get it. it. Like, <laughs> well, I feel like in the that's past, so dumb, I'd be know? like, Oh, it looks good. And you'll be like, it just looks good. Like that's, that's it. it? <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, I spent five like, days yeah, on the sequence. It looks sequence. great. Like, <laughs> That's yes. like my buddy Adam from the videos. He he'll like text me after I release a video and like shoot mm-hmm. it over to him. Um, and you know, like he was on he was on the trip, and I want mm-hmm. like want to hear what he says. He's like, yeah. "It was good." Like that's yeah. all You're he like, says every time. I'm like, <laughs> "All right, yeah. was it good?" I can't like I don't know. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of funny. Um, but I would, so I'd love to talk about Big Land a little bit because yeah. that is probably where a lot of people have. Or I'm sh- hope a lot of people have seen it, and if if you haven't, leave this podcast right now. Go watch it on YouTube, <laughs> and then come back. But um, I guess like this idea of putting together a huge film, because um, you guys had what had been doing YouTube for a little bit, kind of just putting some videos up. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't say we were like doing YouTube really, but we were posting some videos onto YouTube. You had we somewhat of a following, it. right? Yeah, we were posting it to other yeah. places too. Um, I think now more than ever we're starting to focus on YouTube. At the time, we had a, we had a following, but probably like ten thousand subs on YouTube, maybe, and mm-hmm. sub ten thousand followers on Instagram. Yeah. I'd say yeah. at the time, yeah. And so you guys took to Kickstarter to to help kind of help fund the project. Mm-hmm. Um, but Chase, you were saying you you like found out kind of about this place through like a uh, an old field and stream article, mm-hmm. and that's kind of yeah. what like sparked the his, idea. His sleuthing and reading, and I mean, he came to me with this idea, and I was freaked out. I was like, "Oof, that sounds kind of scary and huge, really. Like it's bigger than anything we've ever taken on. Like, how does all of this work? We have no experience with this at all." And I think we talked about it for a while meanwhile you're just like secretly just like wheels are turning and getting you know, the plans he's together. like yeah <laughs> and uh i feel like i was pretty resistant to it for a while yeah i well, was afraid yeah honestly I think it's scary it's a big trip yeah, and it's yeah. way I, out there i think when we first were looking at that article which was a field and stream article written by this guy eddie nickens who's a prominent outdoor writer it was kind of his big break i think in the industry mm-hmm. was this article and i think a lot of people at the time this is Oh, 2004, you know, 17 years ago now. I think the trip was in 2003, so 18 years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, At the time, I think it was a really popular read when, like, print media was still a much bigger deal or whatever. At this point, there aren't, not a lot of younger folks have, like, heard this story. But there was was a time where, like, if you were into fly fishing, you probably read this article in one way or another. It was a very impactful article. And part of the magic of this trip that they had gone on was kind of the same thing as I was saying about our first travel film, that it was like the premise was we're just four dudes. We have outdoor experience. You know, we're outdoor riders. We know how to paddle a little bit. We know how to fish a little bit. We're backpack and camp. We want to go on like an honest to goodness, serious adventure. And like nowhere to us is more magical than Labrador, which for people who are into that part of the country, like northeast of Canada, there's just something about it. You know, it's like the darkest, swampiest, most mysterious far flung place you can get. You know, just has this, this certain like allure and magic to it, which kinda goes back to like the last hundred years of like a history of exploration in that area. And mm-hmm. there's tons of really legendary and deadly adventures that took place in that area. Anyway, it really sort of like captures the imagination. It really captured the imagination of these four buddies. And they were like, We're just gonna go. You know, we're just gonna like save some money and just like buy some canoes. And they had a a friend who sort of had this rumor about like, you're not gonna believe this place nobody goes to no one's been to there's some caribou hunters who were just like in the area waiting to get picked up by a float plane and just like had some like spinning gear with them and like tossed a couple spoons in waiting to be picked up and every cast was like a six or seven pound brookie it's like an undiscovered mecca you know that like should have a lodge on it like a lot of these places up there have but like it doesn't and like no one's been back since then we don't even know if the rumors are true like you should go there and they were like okay like, we're going to go there. You know what I mean? It'll be, mm-hmm. like, our own, like, undiscovered frontier that we can, like, pioneer as buddies. Which, you know, it's important to mention that, like, it's a very, like, white European notion that, like, 
there's really undiscovered frontiers in North America. Native people have been around time immemorial. It's not newly yep. discovered by people. But <laughs> right. There have right. been. But people, people are there. not going out there like no. every no, no, weekend. No, no. This, it's yeah. not. This no, not, this no. Isn't no. it doesn't like, have visitors very yeah. often. Yeah. And um, anyway, they wrote this article and like it really grabbed our imagination too, where it's like, we could do yeah. that. Um, and the article sort of like, there was a lot of mystery left in it and they had to leave. They were only there for like three or four days. They had to leave early and they had all these questions about things that they had started to see and didn't know. And we were like, we could pick up where they left off. Like we could go to the same place and we could do it for much longer and explore much more of that area. Um, cause there isn't a, there isn't a ton of places that are like, nobody knows much about, um, out there. Mm -hmm. There are, but they're not all fishing meccas. You know, people have been flying around in float planes, dropping into places all over the continent looking for, cause it's, one of the main tourist businesses up there is like fishing lodges and hunting lodges. So people are always on the lookout for like the next undiscovered place that could be a thing. And there aren't a ton that have like escaped description at yeah. this point. Most of the places that are really good, someone's already built an operation on them, you know? So mm -hmm. this seemed like one of those few places where like, there's nobody out there. No one goes there and the fishing is that good. We got to see it for ourselves so that was sort of the impetus and i think when we first read the article like you were like yeah that'd be really fun to do yeah like that sounds cool and then i was like well we're <laughs> gonna do it then and then yeah, it was got yeah. a little more serious and it was and like, I was like oh gosh scary. it sounds scary um but yeah gosh. i ended up I, I called up that guy eddie who wrote that article and he was super forthcoming and was like super excited about the project and like helped us plan it out a little bit um but yeah i don't know that, that was that was the jumping off point so like sure. what did it feel like for you guys go like especially when you let's say you have all these plans to set up everything and like you get on that plane to go get dropped off. Like how far out were you again? Like, so the, the trip starts, it's kind of like planes, trains and automobiles. So like mm -hmm. you got to drive to, um, set Quebec where you can get on this, which is like a 15 or 16 hour drive from Massachusetts. So, so we loaded like, two, you know, two canoes onto her Jetta. Onto yeah. The roof which of her was Jetta with impressive. These roof that rack. car is my work truck. <laughs> yeah. With these roof racks that were hanging like four feet off yeah. of either side, you know, they're 17 like, foot canoes, huge canoes. Um, and us, Amy and, and I and our buddy Dylan, Dylan and, and all, all of our gear, the gear thrown into this Dylan, little car. Dylan like barely fit in the back seat. <laughs> and yeah, and we, he's like my size. He's tiny. <laughs> yeah. So we drive 16 hours to get to this train station because we need to get to this town called Shefferville in Quebec with no roads into it. You cannot access it by car. You have to access it by plane or by this one railroad that helps primarily transport um, indigenous people deep into the backcountry where they have all sorts of heritage and industrial lands and you know, places that they like to hunt and fish and wherever. But it's, it's certainly like... For the people in, in Shefferville, because there's no road, this once a week train that's like a 300 mile train ride that goes like 40 miles an hour, it takes forever yeah. or Dang. slower than that. It's, it's their only connection. To it's their only connection. Like they'll take it once a week to go like get nice groceries from yeah. the deal or whatever. Yeah. You know, there's some... it, it's expensive. Everything has to be flown in or mm -hmm. brought in by train. Uh, and... But anyway, so yeah, you drive basically till the road ends and then you get on the train and you take the train yeah. until the tracks end and then you like, end just, up in Shefferville. Just getting there was an adventure. Right. Like we had, none of us had ever been on before. <laughs> yeah. So the nearest outpost to civilization is already a place that like you can't even drive to. So it's super remote. Yeah. And then from there, we and then you we arrive out. at night and our pilot who we also have not met we've only talked to on the phone picks us up in this big bus and like brings us to this cabin in the middle of nowhere which is on his base but yeah it was just it was a whirlwind but like in the best way like i, I don't know it was it was an experience You're like, that i'll never it. forget it's it's happening yeah. yeah and then the, yeah the plane we flew in 130 miles or something by plane and so that's it's important to understand that 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 plane ride 130 miles is the closest place you could get to human outcropping in all directions so yeah. you know a thousand over a, or ten thousand or yeah a thousand square miles i don't know in every direction <laughs> there's no other people um yeah. So but you're also, way out there. It's worth noting that the planning stages of this trip was very long and very arduous mm -hmm. and logistically kind of a nightmare. And it was a total emotional roller coaster for Chase and I. Where some days we were going and then the next day we weren't and it was it was up and down and mm -hmm. yeah, to to actually be like 
in motion and have all this gear and be driving and then getting on this train and moving through all those steps was kind of surreal yeah with all the you know yeah i would say i would say that it was like really nerve-wracking or scary but we had planned for so long it was kind of mostly just exciting but there's still a lot of unknowns like when you got dropped off by the plane were you guys just like (laughs) oh it is so weird you just like like I, don't, I think it's a real like mix of emotions. I think mostly everyone was just super excited, but there is that like reality check of like, oh, that's our lifeline and it's flying away. Yeah. And like, we are truly here alone. Yeah. And we all have to rely on each other. And like Dylan, we didn't know that well, but we had hung out like a day before we started yeah. the journey north, but we had been in contact online and Christopher, like we hadn't even met him yet. And he just took a total leap of faith on us to commit to going into the backcountry for two weeks with these three weirdos who, like, <laughs> you know, we could have been even weirder than we were. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. It, it was it's, a huge team effort, for sure. Yeah, it's important. You know, this is real, real deal wilderness. It's as rugged as the interior of Alaska, which is as rugged as anywhere on Earth. Um, you know... I think in the contiguous United States, the farthest point from any road, anywhere you can get in the United States, is like 27 miles from a road, and it's in Yellowstone. Mm-hmm. Um, we're hundreds of miles from a road. Yeah. And, you know, and people die all the time 10 miles away from a road in the United States. You know, I mean, this is really, it's not like, oh, I twisted my ankle. Um, I'll just hobble the last two miles down the trailhead and be back in my car and go home. Yeah, you or know. like, you know. The potential for things to go callings, wrong are life-threatening yeah. for sure. It's a real deal adventure that we were in a little over our heads. <laughs> um, we're experienced outdoors people, yeah. but this is a trip that was above our pay grade for sure. But the way you gain those experiences is at some point you got to kind of like punch yeah. above your weight on that stuff. Right. You know, there's always, there's always going to be a trip that's outside of your comfort zone for it to become your comfort zone later. Mm-hmm. And this was definitely that trip. Yeah, um, I think sure. there will be bigger adventures in the future, but none, none will be like that one. Cause it was the first, was the first and everything was so yeah. new. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was a big trip for me. Uh, I think turning 30 on that trip was a big milestone and being so afraid leading up to that trip I had so many reservations about it and I tend to be the more cautious of the two of us Mm -hmm. and there were a lot of worries and a lot of stresses and um, going out there and making it through that experience and like feeling like I actually really enjoyed it and um, it was a huge confidence boost for me for for future projects and and bigger adventures but it was really like a huge milestone for me in proving to myself that I could do that type of thing because I I was definitely doubting my ability beforehand and I was pretty freaked out but Mm -hmm. yeah I think it's it's really cool to see the like sliding scale with that kind of stuff too because before going on that trip it was like the wildest thing we could dream up you know Like nothing could be crazier than doing this, and now it's like like I would oh I'd love to do that. Let's go tomorrow. (laughs) Yeah, let's do a bunch more. It's changed, but also like it ignited a huge passion in Chase and I for paddling. That you know we we had to figure out how to work together in a canoe, and we did the Allagash trip, and it was a huge eye opening experience, and we had such a good time. But we like we had a lot to work out on that trip. We had a lot to learn, and we came out of that feeling ready for for labrador and it it did a great job preparing us but we just fell in love with paddling altogether. like yeah you know fish fish was the vehicle that brought us there you know at the end of the day like it was a fishing trip we were interested in the brook trout fishing we had all there's all this other stuff in the peripheral that you're super interested in yeah wilderness and canoe tripping and ecology and native species and you know all this stuff that's sort of around it but like at heart we wouldn't have gone into that place if it weren't for the rumors of the fishing, right? Because we're mm-hmm. anglers at heart. Mm-hmm. But after that trip, we were like, dude, let's just go on like a canoe trip. I don't care yeah. if there's fishing at all. I just yeah. want to go for like a month long and just canoe yeah. a wilderness river. Fishing would be fun, but like the, the canoe tripping became so much fun. Um, something super, super rewarding. And I guess it's what through hikers and stuff get out of trail hiking too, this sort of like incremental progress of like each day you start at one place and all this stuff happens in between and then you end at another place and you like look back and you're like, we did that today and tomorrow yeah. 
we're going to the next place you know it's super super satisfying to sort of like see yourself make progress through space and i think with paddling and it'd be like through hiking or any like long-term type projects like that where it really gives you some time to to like quiet your mind and focus on what you're actually doing where you're not distracted by what you should be doing or what you think you should be doing or work things or home things and you know different projects but you're out there and you are confined to this canoe in the outdoors and your meals are pretty much set and you wake up and you paddle and you eat lunch and you paddle and you eat dinner and you go to bed Mm -hmm. and it was for me like the first time I really felt like I could focus in on like the task at hand and also take time to reflect and think on stuff quietly like within my own head without being bombarded by like outside factors yeah when you're in to achieve that and to feel that was like i just want more of it it was so good (laughs) yeah when you're in like real serious wilderness space and you can still find you know I'm not trying to like scoff at the like yeah. 30 miles from a road in Yellowstone. Wilderness. You can get into some real trouble in the lower 48. Yeah. Right. But in real wilderness space like that, just by pure necessity of how serious the situation is, how serious you have to take where you are and what you need to do to get yourself through whatever experience you're having, there's just like no room for any fluff in your head. You can't be worried about social media or what so and so said to you last Thursday. Like you have to really focus in on the task at hand it's like we need to get to this place before it turns dark and we can build a fire because we're wet because it's raining and we need to be able to get food in our belly and like when you have to focus on tasks like that i don't know it it makes everything in life sort of come into perspective in a way that's easily lost in everyday life we're I'm not trying to be that guy who's like, these days, people, blah, blah, blah. But these days, our lives are very complicated and more complicated than they need to be. We have all sorts of justifications for, like, why they need to be that complicated and, like, well, I need to do this to, like, keep this going and blah, 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 blah. But when you're on a trip like that, you're like, wow, actually, all I really need is, like, some food to get me through the day and, like, a dry place to sleep at night and, like, oh, huge bonus. Like, I have friends that I can talk to along Mm -hmm. the way, like... This is all I need. I'm super, it's amazing how much happier you are, even if the day is like a slog. Yeah. I mean, and also like being a couple, there's obviously a dynamic that's a little bit Mm. different. And not to say that like everyday paddling was a joy because we, on the Allagash trip, we were up against some pretty serious weather and we were behind schedule and we were having to really like work harder than I think I had ever worked on anything yeah. just paddling to get from point A to point B in time, you know, before dark. And um, it fortifies this team relationship yeah. dynamic that was just so important and just so valuable to me, I think is just, totally. you know, there's certainly like days where you're a little snappy, but yeah. Um, and cause you're tired and hungry, whatever, and cold and, but it was so cool to just see us both work together so well in a team setting and like high stress settings. And, uh, it was awesome. It was super rewarding in that sense too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's a really good perspective. I think it's, you learn a lot about your own limits and be like, wow, I'm, I can do way more than I thought I could, yeah. but you also learn how much more we can do together too. Cause yeah. inevitably on one of those trips, it's never, it's never evenly weighted where it's like, I carry you the whole time or you carry me the whole time. There's always going to be a moment where like one person is, is down on something and the other person picks up that slack. I think super like relationship affirming and fortifying. They say that like the death of a relationship is to take a tandem canoe <laughs> trip. Which it like very well could <laughs> Big be. Big test. Yeah. You guys had to take. Yeah. yeah. But um, it's worked out I think for it, us, Yeah. For it sure. was really, really cool to see us come together and work as a team in that way. Yeah. And fi- and just find the balance and mm-hmm. um, yeah, like paddling raft, will teach you a lot of things. No, <laughs> yeah, it's super tippy. Yeah, it's not yeah. like it's not like a raft. It's kind of dangerous. There's just, there's a communication mm-hmm. aspect that like you don't necessarily think about with paddling, but it's so crucial and like you are constantly communicating. Especially doing white water. Yeah. Both oh, both yeah. paddlers yeah. are important for maneuvering the boat. It's not like a raft where one person's on the oars and everyone else is a passenger. Yeah. Like both Each people in the canoe need to be actively their... responding to stimulus that's going at you while you're coming down the river. You can't just make a turn 
and propel yourself with one person you could solo in a canoe but you'd sit in a different place in the canoe which changes the leverage of how it's maneuvered you're more close to the center but when one person's in the front and one person's in the back you can't do it by yourself so you have to be able to communicate in tandem and once you've done it enough you start to sort of like anticipate each other a little bit more you You kind of get like an unspoken communication where like Mm -hmm. everyone's kind of like in tune with each other and when it's going good that's like super satisfying (laughs) when it's not it's a bit frustrating yeah but every every trip we take it's not less yeah it gets better and better for sure yeah yeah i think the canoe aspect of it i really enjoyed just like yeah I don't know. I, I I actually we did some canoeing in or Missouri recently, and mm-hmm. it was very easy canoeing, but yeah. it was really cool. But yeah. thinking about like how you guys would pack all your gear in there yeah. and keep it safe, like I love all that stuff. Yeah. I'm like a real like packing I love seeing nerd, the build out like, too, like <laughs> of the canoe yeah. because yeah. you guys I love had to the custom make it. Like tetrising of items and organizational side of stuff, which I ended up doing a lot on the Big Land trip because mm-hmm. uh, he was more of the like you know video yeah thinking through all that kind of stuff Mm -hmm. and it was really easy for me to just go into that role of like food planning gear planning organizing packing putting things in little bags and yeah i i love that kind of stuff it's like anything else that's like a backcountry travel um endeavor like that like if you listen to serious through hikers talk about yeah how they get how they've like perfectly packed their gear you know people are cutting off half their toothbrush to reduce weight and right. like everything mm-hmm. has its place and you only take the like absolute bare necessities and like it's the same thing when you're canoe packing because we didn't run into a ton of as the canadians would say portaging americans say portaging where essentially you reach an impasse in a river that you can't float and you have to carry over it whether it's land mm-hmm. or water or whatever yeah and sometimes but, they're like a mile long. It's they not be, they always can be just miles like long, a right. And so, like anything you have over. with you, you got to be prepared to carry it on your back through some rough shit. Yeah. Um, where it's gonna and like multiple so, like, times because yeah. you typically cannot carry all of the gear, and then like add camera gear to that. It's just like yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it's it's heavy. Cause it, so you guys, what did it look like for like how you paddled? Because it wasn't like a typical float where you just get dropped mm-hmm. off and you you float to the takeout like mm-hmm. what did it look like that like was the, whole the area. plan the plan that was, was how yeah that's oh, how you okay. always want it start to go <laughs> that is not how it went yeah. the plan was start at the top we had you know spent tons of time pouring over satellite maps and topo maps and yep. figuring out our route lots of it based on sort of like where eddie and his team had fished and where they hadn't fished and like where we wanted to explore extra and whatever we had this like perfect route figured out that we were super psyched on and when we flew in, the pilot looking down at the lake that we had planned to land on, and you know, the pilots we're never... doing like circles, and I'm just getting more and more nauseous. Like, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. The, the pilots... he's looking at the lakes like Mm-mm. the pilots never been there either. So like we yeah. we planned this all out on maps, and yeah, okay, sure, this looks good. I'll drop you off here, and we'll pick you up here in X amount of days, and we have a satellite communication device to be able to you know make plans. But when we're flying over it water just looked super shallow to the point where he wasn't comfortable landing the floats in it and he was like well we're not landing there and he was like well let's let's go take <laughs> so, like, a look on the fly <laughs> yeah really gonna like replay now that yeah. we've seen this that this doesn't look good we better go look at the drop off or the pickup point at the end so we flew all the way down there and he's like oh, i can't I'm not landed on that either like that doesn't look good either so we're sort of like this is a moment where we're all on the plane sort of discussing. Yeah. And I've got the we headset gotta make in call. talking with the pilot. None of us know what's happening in the back. Trying to communicate with him where it's kind of like, what do you want to do? You want to go home? You know, yeah. you Are we going or are we not? <laughs> can't land here. And we're like, well, we got to try and find somewhere along this route where you can land. And pretty much like smack dab in the middle of the float we had planned, which we had planned for lots of fishing. But, you know, a two week float. I don't know that it, it's probably like 40 miles of water. Or so that's something. what yeah. it was, two weeks? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and it was a it, small amount of water to cover in that amount of time, yeah. but we figured we'd be so slow with all the fishing. We'd spend multiple days in each place. And but still, you know, 40 miles is a big area to, you know, yeah. to cover. Um, but yeah, there was a lake right in the middle. And it's this basically what this area is, is sort of like headwater lakes to a river system. So it's like lake connected by a mile or two of river to another lake connected by some more mile or two of river to another lake. So it's kind of like ponds interconnected. One of the lakes in the middle, he was like, that looks good. We could land there. So we're like, well, that's it. 
go down there. <laughs> yep. You know what I mean? If that's the only spot, like that's where we'll go. We'll just figure out the rest of it afterwards. Did um, you, so did you guys have a GPS deal mm-hmm. or okay? Well, yeah, we have a Garmin inReach, we, which we, we also carry had with like us, printed and we had out printed like um, waterproof USGS style matches. Yeah, can, oh, Canadian maps. topographical maps of the area that we had our notes on and stuff for every section, like really close um, topography where like you know a mile is like this long on the map so they're like pretty detailed um Mm -hmm. imagery of so you could kind of tell where you were throughout. yeah we um, our our canoes were all like this this whole world of canoe tripping with like all this gear that most people in canada there's a real culture around it there really isn't in the united states Um, we sourced most of our gear from canada yeah sourced all this stuff but like you know our canoes had like sealable like waterproof like Map pockets. Map pockets that like yeah. sit right on the canoe, so like each day's like, like route you can have on it, and cool. you can see it right at all times. So like yeah, there's, there's all this stuff that sort of like allows you to do this kind of stuff efficiently. Um, but yeah, so we landed there, and we're like, I guess there's no choice, but like if we want to see the stuff upstream that we had planned on starting at, we're just gonna have to like go upstream. Yeah. <laughs> um, which this is pretty fast moving water. Um, it's kind of just like miles of serious riffles and rapids so it's you can't just like paddle up it going up river means like you're walking up it and dragging your canoes and it's not easy to walk because the rivers are like big boulders with big like you know gaps between them Mm -hmm. and they're slick so you're you're having to really and when you're carrying that much weight with a canoe like we're walking it in the water and you're pulling it and you're working with another person it's very dangerous like you could slip easily into some of these cracks and, and gaps and catch yeah, your it's, leg. Yeah, it's not, and, if you're thinking about rivers in the United States that have, like, yeah. gravel bars and stuff, that's not... It's not gravel. No, these are. They're just giant, <laughs> yeah. like, you know, car-sized boulders with, like, human-sized holes in yeah, between so you're, like, them that you can fall into. Yeah, so you like, jumping between them and trying to get steady footing and while so dragging just the canoe. drag it upstream to get to, like, the next lakey section kind yeah. of deal? Until, yeah. yeah, until we had a, a lake-type section that we could paddle across and then yeah, get I mean, out. Yeah, basically the goal thing. to get upstream was just, like, you just push all the way up to where we wanted our top spot to be, and then from there you come down. You go work down. down. Yeah. Okay. Um, but it'd be, it, like, a full day of pushing The way it up. ended up going yeah. is, it like, a lot of work. we ended up all the way down at the bottom of our route and made the trip all the way to the top so we did the entire route we had planned upstream at one point um it was in the, in the end the way it worked day. out like <laughs> us looking for fish and trying to find fish like we did the route like three times over in different up and down increments um, yeah which is fine but it makes for like long hard days pushing up river um, mm-hmm. it can be quite taxing going down river especially in white water you're like really it's a lot of on your toes thinking and, and it's, planning it's quite physical and... our canoes with gear just the canoes and gear probably weighed 300 pounds and then with each with two sets of people you're, you're 500 pounds plus maneuvering them around in tight water is like really taxing i mean your arms hurt from paddling and like especially having to do tight stuff with these big tripping canoes in like pocket rapids and stuff yeah, yeah. downstream will wear you out but upstream days where you're just like you're inching just like... your way up and then in the in the lakes where you do paddle you're paddling up river and there's like little bits of current in them still, and most of the time it seems Hopefully like no matter what direction wind. you're going in, there's a headwind. <laughs> yeah, oh. and th- yeah, those days are just like exhausting going up. Yeah, we bring mm-hmm. like Cheetos and Sour Patch Kids for those days, nice. just for like yeah. a little morale boost. You get like each person gets a few pieces, get through rapid, to, like, get two keep Cheetos it together, <laughs> and like you know a little calorie boost. But so like along with all of this, like this really strenuous like work that you have to put in and just like Mm -hmm. just really to get up the stream but also just like surviving out there and like Mm -hmm. to fish you guys are filming on top of this yeah so like how does you know how does that work for filming side with having your gear and like setting up like oh we need a shot for this and like when did when did you kind of like pick and choose like when it's like all right in wilderness mode or like all right i need like shots like what was the balance like for filming it's pretty challenging Mm -hmm. but I think with every project, it gets a little bit easier, maybe. But um, when we're in very difficult or taxing situations, it's pretty hard for us to take out cameras and set them up. Sometimes Chase would take out the GoPro and attach it to a canoe or, you know, for me with with stills, it's always much more accessible because I can take a camera out, take a few photos, put it away. But as far as like setting up a whole camera rig... um, it's it's pretty tough. Uh, 
But also with Dylan and Christopher, like they knew that we needed to be able to film. So it's always nice to be working with two people who are very patient and understanding of that uh, and just making sure you take the time to to stop and and set up and and film stuff but I feel like there was a lot of moments where we wished we were filming but there was just too much happening or it was a a safety risk or you know something like that where you just you just can't yeah yeah you know those trips are really hard and inevitably the hardest days escape the camera a lot (laughs) because they're just so hard and the um, consequences are serious enough that fiddling around with the camera um, just has to stop being a priority for everyone's safety. Um, and I wish it wasn't that way because it's some of the highest drama, you know, yeah. it's some of the most dangerous stuff mm-hmm. and the most taxing stuff. And it's the stuff that people would probably be really interested to see. And we're trying to find that balance. If you watch, there's a whole ecosystem of people who just do like wilderness survival and tripping videos on YouTube. And it's all pretty much just like 100% GoPro because yeah. it's great. It's small. Yeah, you need something. You just you turn it on. You can run it for hours and not run out of space. Set it and forget it. Um, it requi- It doesn't require a lot on top of what you're doing. You can you can be in a very perilous situation and that camera is just running ambient in the background and you don't have to do much work on it. We're really um, compelled by the idea of trying to make those types of films but with a higher production value. Um, bigger cameras, more professional cameras um, that can sort of deliver both those great stories but also have like a visual impact that those other films just will never have by nature of having mm-hmm. you know a dinky little action camera shooting all of it um but yeah the truth is some most of the hardest stuff doesn't get filmed and i'm sort of starting to come to grips with like might just have to like use the gopro a little more often mm-hmm. and yeah some of those yeah, situations. Yeah, we want to be better about it because um, like after the, the fact, it's yeah. just yeah, like that would have been what it needs so to nice be, to have. What but... it needs to be is like you need just like a dedicated camera person yeah. who's like job. <laughs> it's is hard to, to do be the nothing. camera people and the adventure people, right? Right. And the right. fishing people. But the problem yeah, is you're doing everything. Yeah, but with trips like that, everyone's on an adventure no matter what. Mm-hmm. You know, so like you just have to be in the zone when it cut. Even if someone was there is just like dedicated, like, oh, that's camera boat. All they do is film all day. Like, they still got to go down the same damn rapids yeah. <laughs> that everyone else has got to go down. And like, right. you just cannot have a camera in your hands. You need your hands on the paddles. Like, you just can't be doing it. You're going to flip and you're going to die, you know? So, yeah. Um, yeah. Some, some of the great stuff got missed. Um, some of it we were able to get. But it's like, for example, there's a, there's a bear scene in that film um, where we had just eaten lunch, this big black bear came out of the woods on the other side of the river. Um, we have these things that no one in the United States will know of. Anyone from Canada will know. And maybe anyone who's watched these videos, we know called bear bangers, really popular bear deterrent up in Canada. I think they're illegal in the U S mm-hmm. um, <laughs> it's basically just like an M 80 with like a um, pen flash launcher. bang. Um, it yeah, just it's, makes it's launched okay. out of a pen. Um, it's like a flare, but instead of instead of the like a flare burning know. up, it shoots up and goes bang, and it's like it's a shotgun, like a shotgun shell blast. going off in the air. But it doesn't have a projectile that harms anything. It's just a really big, loud noise um, for deterring bears. Super popular up in Canada. We had bear bangers with us, and our understanding going into that trip is like, it's like you know in Alaska, guys shooting a shotgun up into the air when a grizzly is near a float. You know, like bears scatter under that type, mm-hmm. and especially up there, a bear that almost 100% has never seen a person in its entire life. This is going to be a pretty traumatic experience for the bear. That. You know, it's not yeah. going to want to hang around when things start going boom. We shot that bear banger off, and it didn't even flinch. Like yeah, its ears it didn't even move. Very determined to get and across was, the rapids. It was still to get coming to us. at us. We were on the other side of the rapids, and it was like dipping and its of course, feet in, like, trying to figure out where Chase it could cross. Chase has a full, sewn like big Sony out on tripod on gear tripod. scattered all over the rocks. And we're trying to figure out what to do, and like, you know, we go get the bear banger, we come back, and we fire at the bear, and it doesn't do anything. It just keeps coming at us, and Chase has got this whole camera set up. And he wa- he's been wanting to film it, but you just can't. <laughs> like your safety is yeah. Is we on saw the, the line. bear in the distance, and we're like, oh, a bear! And I like yeah, got all like, framed up. I was like, I gotta out. shoot this. And we were framed up to shoot running a rapid in that spot, which mm-hmm. is why we were there. We pulled over. We saw it coming up. We're like, we should film this. This is a really great piece of white water. This will be great. Yeah, and within like a minute. And the bear and showed half. up, and so I have some shots of the bear because it showed up while I had my camera set up, and I just had to swing the tripod over. Oh, there's the bear. I got framed up, and I got some shots. But like 
this incredible moment with the banger going off and the bear not doing anything. And then like, we had to make a run for the boats and like Christopher fell on the rocks in the middle of it, like face down in the river. It's just like total panic, like like, trying to get to the boats. Like none of that's on camera. Cause who's going to be filming that when we're all, I'm trying to get all the gear together. We're trying to get into the boats. So what you end up with is this sequence of like the bear approaching and then us in the lake on the canoe and the bear circling us on the shore trying to figure out how it's going to get to our canoe out in the middle of the lake. And like it's all very dramatic and we use voiceover to try and fill in that stuff. But like, yeah, if I had a GoPro strapped to my forehead that was just running the whole time, you would have yeah, got that. You know? yeah, that's you one of those moments that like footage, but... you cannot plan something like that. But that's like gripping cinema if you have it. Yeah. But like how do you get that? in like with a nice camera planned it's just yeah. it's just kind of impossible basically mm-hmm. you can't you have to end up getting it by more sort of like stealth means with a gopro like that but yeah, something yeah, like, we're trying to get better at because you're trying to like I, th- I feel like with the types of films that you guys yeah. make and that i'm trying to make is like you want to capture moments more yeah. so i think at first you're just shooting you're shooting footage you're like oh yeah. this could be a cool shot you shoot mm-hmm. this and then you splice it together with a song but like moments are really hard like you want to just be yeah. there for that moment and yeah, capture that yeah because you can't like make someone do yeah. the same thing again exactly. the moment is gone you can't just have a bear just show up like that's yeah. what makes the story mm-hmm. and yeah it's tough because you gotta fight the balance of like do I need to like is this a like life or death situation yeah. do I need to yeah. worry about that or yeah. do I need to film yeah you were talking about how you had a little ch- little uh, gear error let's say on on the trip tell me what happened with the the camera and like the audio deal <laughs> yeah i feel like you can take this one amy you telling the story <laughs> well me, it's too painful. i will say like always check your rental gear before you take it on a trip um which is very basic and simple but we i guess <laughs> forgot to do that or maybe it worked at our house and then it, it didn't seemed like it worked but yeah, we got into the fish up in Labrador and it was this big exciting moment that was happening and everyone was fishing and running around like crazy and yelling and screaming and it was super exciting and I go to grab our underwater camera because I think this is a great opportunity. We're going to get these huge fish with these bright colors. It's like super bright sun. And it'll be great. Um, turn on the camera, getting ready to put it in the underwater housing and it's like completely broken it's just like screen confetti on the back (laughs) doesn't turn on doesn't function at all and you know that was a huge disappointment and then turns into just a dead weight in your pack that you're hauling around for two weeks and that was a huge disappointment but you had an even I guess more critical failure that was we had other cameras we just didn't have other like but then again nice underwater cameras but Yeah, the the weight was a bummer, but we were like, all right, we can we can deal. But then you can talk yeah, the about audio, that. Yeah, the audio <laughs> input on our our main DSLR that we're using for sort of like it's sort of like B cam, but it's also kind of like A cam because we could fit it could come in and out easier than our bigger you know higher end camera. Could. Also, so it got used worth for a lot noting of that it was like three weeks old. Yeah, it was like brand, brand new. Yeah. We bought it for that project. Um, Sony. <laughs> yeah. Jesus Christ. Get on it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, the audio input stopped working, which is our primary way. Anyone who makes films knows that like the inboard mics on are essentially unusable. Like, you have to have an external mic to be able to get anything that's like worth anything. Yeah. And all of a sudden we had no ability to record audio on our main camera. And yeah, there's no way to just fix it. It's like some tiny ribbon cable inside there that's busted. You, one, we don't have tiny screwdrivers to take it apart, but even if you did, you couldn't fix it. It's like, that's just out. Like, audio's gone. And luckily, we took enough gear with us that I had another small external recorder um, that basically the microphone still worked, but the interface to get it into the camera didn't work. So I plugged that microphone into this other little recorder and just duct taped it to the side of the camera and would just press record on both simultaneously as much as I could remember to anytime I shot anything and then try and sync it back yeah. in post. So. Yeah, you know, I mean, you try and plan for, like, it's one of those things you can't just bring, like, two of everything because you yeah, have to be really careful about what and... you bring. You just have to hope that your gear works. But in the event that it doesn't, you just got to get creative. Can I have a definitely always plan. bring duct tape yeah, on any say, trip. Definitely like, need duct, duct tape. tape. Yeah. <laughs> mil- you can do that anything with duct tape. That and Gorilla Table fix yeah. literally you can, anything. You can, you can fix your a, boat with that. Yeah, you can yeah. make a cup out of 
duct tape if you wanted to and a fork probably (laughs) it's insane yeah gosh yeah i can't imagine that that exact same thing happened to my sony and i had to get i descended and get fixed and it's just a whole mess it's so frustrating um but what do you guys think was like the biggest challenge of this trip uh, and then the biggest challenge for the production oh geez the biggest challenge of the trip for sure was just like getting it off the ground yeah i think the planning the planning process was just so rough on us like we would think that we had stuff figured out and then a few days later like everything would fall apart we were trying to organize like there was a lot of logistical legal things to to work out because we were americans going to canada and we were Mm -hmm. you know um needing certain services from a guide and a lodge and yeah so labrador has a rule um labrador and quebec that above the 53rd parallel which is you know a certain point along the map i think you're running out of slot space or something oh hold on (laughs) holy shit ups UPS is is ripping through here (laughs) That guy is clearly not paid by the hour. Is he paid by the delivery? He's <laughs> like, I need to get home. Also, for anyone oh, listening, I have weird. allergies, all right? I don't normally sound this nasal. <laughs> Although we talked about, like, getting roasted by YouTube comments. My all-time favorite roast that somebody gave me on YouTube it was on Big Land, and it said, and the award, the Mucinex award for most congested narrator goes to... <laughs> And I was like, wow. Let's go. <laughs> this guy has lit got lit me up. Dude. <laughs> Sometimes it's like you just got to get It's too good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you got to get the job done. I was like, I don't think I was like that nasally in that like voiceover, but this like. This guy does. Whether I was or I wasn't, like that was a good roast of anyone that yeah. you, that someone's decided is like congested. Um. Anyway, so yeah, I was saying um, Labrador has a, a rule and so does Quebec above the 53rd parallel. Um, if you're a non-resident, and that doesn't just mean out of the country, that means even out of the province of Labrador. If you were Canadian from another province, this would still apply to you. You, If you fish um, or hunt, um, you have to do so in the presence of a licensed Newfoundland and Labrador guide, um, or if, in your, if you're in Quebec, a Quebec licensed guide, which if you're Canadian, it's pretty easy to get a guiding license. Basically, you just need like hunter's safety, boater's safety, and wilderness EMT certification of some kind, and then you like apply for it spend 10 or 15 bucks and you get a certification and then you're like a licensed guide you don't have to do anything super complicated other than just like take a couple tests to prove your competency so if you happen to be and anyone from any province can get a license to guide in labrador as long as you've met labrador's specific requirements so if you were canadian you could get around this rule pretty easily by just getting your own guiding license and then you can guide yourself um Americans are not allowed to go through that process. The only way to get a, a guiding license up there would be to own a lodge on Canadian soil, which we obviously don't own a lodge. <laughs> um, that would have been a lot of work. So we there. had this issue. We're like, we have this dream where we want to go on this trip to the super remote place, but we have to do it with a guide. And yeah. like, what does that mean to have a guide in a place no one's been, only four people yeah. have been in the last <laughs> hundred years, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and like Chase and I were used to doing all these trips just with ourselves it's weird you so, gotta like, meet to a total bring stranger new people into the mix was definitely weird for us but there's a moment where we're like we realized there's no way to get around this and i would say that this is probably the most challenging thing about the production side of it is people do trips out in this that part of that country often there's tons of canoe trips like i said there's a big culture around that kind of stuff there's mm-hmm. lots of great expeditions going on every year someone's planning some new grand trip in and around you know the north of canada somewhere by canoe and uh there's no one out there. You're not going to run into a game warden or something like that. Um, so if you wanted to just fish, if you want to just go out there and, you know, the rule is a little bit silly because a lot of these trips that people do, there's a real subsistence need to be able to catch and eat fish as part. You just can't pack yeah. enough food into your canoe, you know, right. last you for three months if you want to go canoe out there or whatever. So um, for the most part, I think it's sort of people, the, the government out there will let slide um, some fishing that's not with the guide because no one no one's around to find out about it and if they hear about it oh, okay sure yeah the guy caught a couple trout to cook up on the stove or whatever nobody we're not going to like prosecute this or that but this project was high profile because we had sponsors behind it um, we wanted to have a wide distribution for it so there's an absolute necessity to like do it 
correctly because yeah, there would be, be the there would be consequences you know if we um we're advertising on a large scale that like people can just go break the law in canada like that's not gonna fly um and we also just from an ethical standpoint want to obey the rules and regulations of whatever place and how they choose to manage their wild spaces so um but if it was make or break and like we couldn't go unless we had a guide and we weren't making a film project we'd probably just have gone and like not told people that like we fished without yeah. a guide which you know happens often up there um <clears throat> but we for sure needed to do it right because we're trying to set a good example for people too we don't want to like spawn a whole generation of people who think they can just go up there and like you know poach fish or whatever without... there's no joke going into the wilderness too yeah. like you yeah, want to make sure other that's that's really i think what it's about out there too. Um, is to make sure that people aren't putting themselves in situations that they can't handle. So by having someone who's licensed, who knows what they're doing out there, because it's a huge strain on the economy too, if they have to send a rescue yeah. plane out to help some idiot who right. you know, thought he was whatever, some great explorer. <laughs> um, so yeah, so there, there was that issue of how do we find a guide? Um, and it turns out nobody wanted to do it. Um, Cause <laughs> no. <laughs> if you if you are there's tons of people who really like to do adventures like this but if you're actually making your living as a guide why would you ever go on some to some untested unproven unknown area with a bunch of Americans you've never met when you're getting paid excellent to sleep in a warm lodge at yeah, night like with eat a big, warm meal <laughs> with like big tipping American clients mm -hmm. and have home cooked like very few people who do that kind of stuff for a living think it's quite as fun as the people who don't do it for a living who want to do it for a good time, you know? So um, we had an open call out through the Outfitters Association in Labrador to try and find somebody who would go on that trip with us. And basically no one would go except didn't for this. You, like look into the indigenous mm -hmm. uh, guides? Yeah, well, we tried to find native to guides find... and there was a huge project going on in Shefferville that summer where a lot of the, the guys, the indigenous folks up there who would do um, guiding like that and we're busy working on this big mining project. There's just like no one who could do it. Luckily, we found somebody who wanted to do it, but his interest in doing it came with all sorts of trepidation of his own. He'd never been on a trip this big either. Um, he was the youngest of all of us. Um, I think at the time he was... I think he was 22? Yeah, Dang. 20, 22. 21, 22? Maybe, yeah, 21, something like that. He'd guided at some lodges. Great, great angler and great guy and now, you know, friend for life. Uh, but he was back and forth being like yeah, let's do it. You don't have to pay me anything. Like, let's just go. Like, this sounds like awesome to them being like, oh, I don't know if I can do this. I'm really like second guessing doing, it. I shouldn't do this. Like I can't give up my summer's guiding to go do this. And like, um, it took a lot of back and forth. That's what Amy was alluding to. We're like early on, it was real touch and go for a while. We're yeah. like, right. Cause it all hinged on him. If Chris couldn't if he, come, if he couldn't, couldn't do be the it, guide, we, we couldn't, couldn't, we couldn't do push the trip. forward. Um, it would be illegal to do the trip. Like it just wasn't going to happen. It's dead in the water. Um, and yeah, he's, you know, having not been on a big trip like this, he's nervous about all the kind of stuff that like anyone who hasn't been on a big trip is nervous about survival stuff, bears, um, hurting yourself out there. And the yeah. other guides, the older guides at the lodge he was working at that summer were really giving him a hard time and like kind of filling his head with like stories of like, oh, I wouldn't go up there without like yeah. lots of guns. Like there's lots of wolf up there and lots of bear up there. And like all those things are true, but they were all just kind of like trying to steer him into not doing it mm -hmm. um which if you're on the fence of something you're like super impressionable either way like yeah, yeah. so i'm like fighting via like the phone in the united states being like no dude like we like got you this. got this, this is gonna be sick it's gonna be experience of a lifetime like we gotta yeah. do it and meanwhile everyone back at home is like i don't think you should do this Who so are it was these? literally like Who are these american people on tuesday like, it was like oh chris is on board like this is happening and then wednesday it'd be like i don't think we're going and like the emotional oh, <laughs> side of like, that of was this. was yeah. hard because so, we had already been planning for quite a while at that point and it was getting to a critical point of like we now need to do this kickstarter because everything is costing so much more than we expected and, and the flights and everything yeah. else so like we need a full commitment mm -hmm. but you also like can't force someone right. into that position and it was high stress for a yeah, moment and there. you know at the time <laughs> I had spoken in advance because I knew this was going to be a problem because this was a problem actually for the original expedition that wrote the field and stream article for Eddie. They didn't, the wording in the, the legal documents are, is ambiguous. It just says that like anyone wishing to fish must engage the services of an outfitter or something along those lines, which is like, well, what does that mean? Like, Mm -hmm. If you get flown in by an outfitter, like, have you engaged the services then? Are you good to go? And at the time, 
this was much less fleshed out and you know they were flown in by an outfitter it was their buddy who like had said told them about the rumors of this place to begin with and they thought they were all good and they wrote this article and it ended up being this like really really popular article um, but they weren't fishing with a guide it was just four american dudes out there they thought that they had met that requirement by having a guide and outfitter fly them in they didn't need to be present the entire time they were fishing and it backfired i think they they suffered like pretty um severe legal recourse from the mm-hmm. government of newfoundland labrador especially because you know it's a it's a large platform that they wrote for a major publication in the United mm-hmm. States, basically saying like you can and, DIY. And the point of the article was like do a DIY trip. trip. You can do it like this, and they were yeah. like, no, you can't, and like you broke the law, and you're all gonna pay <laughs> the price yeah. for it. So I knew that from speaking to Eddie that this was like we can't make the same mistake. So I spent a lot of time on the phone with government officials, figuring out what exactly do we need to do so we make sure like we don't do the wrong thing. And what they initially said was like. Um, Anyone who has a guiding license, you know, through the steps that I explained earlier, can come along as a guide and he needs to be there all the time, but that's it. You're good with that. You don't need to like hire an outfitter outside of that or whatever. Like, as long as you were the guide, you're good. Um, and so Chris was on board. He was like, you don't even have to pay me. I've got my guiding license. Let's do it. It's going to be a great adventure. Um, and then he, once he started to get nervous, he's like, I don't know. I'm talking with the other guides here and I'm talking with the lodge owner. And like, they don't think that like we're all squared away legally. Um, they think I'm hearing people saying like, we'd need to sleep at a lodge at night and like, we have to come back every night and like, well, that's not going to happen. Yeah. You know? So I, I was like, all right, fine. I didn't really want to like, I'd gotten the okay from the government. So I didn't, <laughs> didn't really, really want to like, like stir to, like, the pot, but yeah. I was like, I'll hit him up again. Them. Yeah. I'll, I'll contact him again. And like, I'll make double sure. Yeah. Like we're yeah. doing this all right. And they were like, mm, on second thought oh that i'm thinking about like it. literally like, those words yeah. it was like very unclear I think, maybe, I think maybe you should make sure to have like an outfitter engaged too in some capacity make yeah. sure that like don't just make sure that it's like a an authorized outfitter who like flies you in and provides some sort of service picks you up does a couple yeah. things in between and in that case whatever guide you have should needs to come from that outfitter. So now it's not just like find anyone with a guiding license. It's find a, someone a literal working needle in a haystack. for an outfitter. <laughs> and Chris had as guides up there. So he has certain outfitters that he works with. Yeah. So we had to get put in touch with an outfitter who would do it. And then the outfitter was like, look, here's the deal. If I'm going to say I outfitted this trip, there's got We got to exchange money here. There's no yeah. like Chris ain't like, going for free. You got to pay, you gotta pay this, him his rate for, for the whole time he's there. Yep. And you got to pay me for the outfitting fee, which for anyone listening is to the tune of $6,000 oh is what it costs gosh. to have a guide and the outfitter do this two week trip on top of the flights that cost $14,000. So there's 20,000. Yeah. So oh there's 20 God. grand yeah. in flights and outfitting costs to go <laughs> on this front. trip. A yeah. far cry from Eddie's article, which said it cost them 2,500 bucks split between four people to go on this trip yeah. 20 years ago or whatever. Um, so I'd say that was the biggest. So that was why we had to do a Kickstarter. Yeah. We <laughs> yeah. thought we could self-fund it. Our pockets weren't deep enough no. once we really got down to brass tacks. That was the biggest, you know, all the like, it's mm-hmm. hard to film in the wilderness and yeah. how do you charge your camera just, gear and all that kind of stuff aside. It was so important to make sure we did it right. Yeah. Yeah. The hardest thing was getting legally squared away. And yeah, yeah it couldn't, it, there's no way it could have happened without Chris. Yeah. Um, and he shout was the only Chris. person. Yeah. Shout He's out listening. Chris. Shouts out to Chris Sinclair. Um, and in the end, you know, he wasn't just, he didn't end up just being there to fulfill a paper requirement. He ended up being, you know, super hard worker and like yep. super well motivated, yeah. amazingly fishy person. And like, yeah, a great, a great addition to our team of three. And yeah. Just and now blended in seamlessly. Like it was like we all had known each other for that's was forever. like yeah, the coolest for thing about yeah. like the like doing a back back packing trip or backcountry trip. Like I've have not done anything nearly rem- close to what you guys have done, but I've been in some situations in the backcountry. Mm-hmm. You know when you get bad weather and there's mm-hmm. rain, there's snow, and there's all this, and like it's so cool just being able to work with a team, like yeah. work together with the guys. Cause you're so locked in. It's not like you have this phone that's like distracting mm-hmm. you. Like you're yeah. so locked in. And, mm-hmm. you're so present. With, yeah. Like everything. That's and you on. have to like be working together to pretty much survive, even though like, yeah. you know, in, in, in some cases, yeah. but I love that part of it. Like the camaraderie mm-hmm. and everything, but like this wrapping, uh, yeah, <laughs> dude, he's killing it. UPS guy over here. Yeah, yeah. he slowed down just to not. Yeah. Down UPS guy too. bombs down these roads. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you guys now, 
I guess being removed from that trip, mm-hmm. maybe like a year or two. Um, what do you think is like the biggest thing that you've taken away from that whole experience? Like what, what do you guys have now that you didn't have mm-hmm. before you went on that trip? Man. I mean, I think for me, I talked a little bit about it before, but just a confidence in myself that I can do these types of things and, and not even just in like adventure and outdoor spaces, but just to, to believe in myself a little bit more than I may have initially, uh, and to trust myself. And that was a huge, a huge takeaway for me, um, on that trip for sure. Yeah. I think probably your, your takeaway is more about like, it was your, a, a your personal, f- your growth, physical limits. Sure. Um, yeah. whereas like I'm more, I mean, I guess, boys are probably always more natural risk takers than girls but i'm in particular a high risk activity person skateboarder for years like i'll fling my body at just about i don't worry too much about am i going to get hurt can i physically keep up with how demanding this is going to be like i'll slog kind of through anything but i think i have the same takeaway of like self-confidence more just in the ability to like realize a dream of some kind you know looking back at it now that was so complicated to get that yeah. trip together and then to make the film and, and all that. So, I mean, it took a year of our lives where we did basically nothing else for a, a two week trip. You know, there's a whole year around that to make that like come to reality and have a film be made out of it. But it started off as so like unattainable. You know, we're like, oh, I'd like to do that. Like, well, all right, where do we start? You know, yeah. and just being like looking at it and being like, I don't know that we'll ever see the light at the end of the tunnel on this, but we just like, pressed on under this belief that like we could make it happen and i think post that trip nothing really seems like unattainable yeah. now you know it's just no matter how big it is even like looking at it now where it's like well geez that's even bigger than that trip or that's you know a thousand times more complicated it's like whatever it is like we yeah, can figure I'm out how figure to do it that out. Mm-hmm. yeah for sure which i think is huge and i think it's really important why people like set whatever it is it doesn't have to be a canoe expedition in the subarctic like set a challenge for yourself and make it through it you know it's super important i think to like that challenge could be as simple as like i don't want to drink soda for three days or something you know and like set a goal stick with it overcome whatever that challenge is and i think yeah it just like opens up your whole world Mm -hmm. i think there's so much stuff that everyone thinks they can't do because they've told themselves they can't do it. Somebody else has told them they can't do it. The news tells them they can't do it. Social media tells them they can't do it. And really, you can basically do anything outside of certain, like, very serious physical limitations. Yeah. I'll never be a professional basketball player, no matter how bad I want to dunk on someone. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, that's just never going to happen. Yeah. But most of the other stuff, we're only, like, limited by our own conception of, like, what limits us, you know? which I think is, is huge. And I'm super grateful that we've like managed to build a life where we're able to sort of like self-realize that stuff. And I'm not saying we're in our finished form or anything and right. we've like done all the stuff yeah. we want to do, but just sort of like the world becomes a much bigger and more exciting place when you kind of get to a point where you're like, we could do anything basically that we set our minds to and like yeah. figure a way mm-hmm. through it. Then you're only limited to like your imagination, you know? It's like you got to step into that like uncertainty and that yeah. unknown yeah. to like really see your potential. Yeah. And I think even if, you know, people aren't going to do that trip, I think you guys have sparked some inspiration mm-hmm. in a lot of people who have seen the film and definitely in me and not just in like taking a trip, but just like filmmaking and really just like having, yeah. like you said, having a goal of like, you know what, like it doesn't have to be that trip, but maybe there's this trip that we want to plan and like, we can do this because like these normal people have done it. And so I think there's something like really real and like inspiring about Mm -hmm. that, um, from your story. And the fact that you're able to document that is just so incredible. Um, and so I just say props to you guys for that. That's huge. Thanks guys. And uh, I'm really excited to kind of see like what is next for you guys. I think we're excited to see what's next too. We're always scheming about something and, Totally. Coming up with new trips and ideas. And uh, yeah, I should say there is something that limits us and everyone, and that's time. Yes. Yep. We're limited <laughs> yeah, we not only by like how time. much how much time you can do stuff in each day or month or year, um, because you know if one trip takes a year, how many of those can you plan over the course yeah. of your life? Right. Not that many. Which, right. Yeah, really but also right. just limited in like how long we'll be in like the physical shape where we can do real hard stuff, you know. And you start mm-hmm. looking at it like that, and you're like, 
Yeah, it shit. incites We've a got bit like of panic, actually. 20 <laughs> years, maybe, if we're lucky, of like serious expeditioning that we could do, and there's enough trips that could fill 500 years. Yep, so like, yeah. we're trying right. to pick, like, what would we want to try and do, you know? Yeah. Like, what's the next frontier of like what's possible and what we'd want to do and yeah like i said i don't want it to make i don't want it to sound like we we think that we're like real serious adventurers because there's like straight up people who like walk to antarctica and support it and stuff <laughs> yeah. there's amazing adventurers out there we're small time um when it comes to that kind of thing but we're also just like yeah. totally normal people and like i think some of the adventures we've managed to go on are kind of like way bigger than we are you know which is like the cool thing that like Normal folks who just, like, really are motivated to do something can, like, find themselves in, like, a mess of trouble real quick, which is awesome. You know, they're, like, in the in this world that you can, like, mm-hmm. you can set a goal that's, like, way more adventurous than, like, anything you have any business doing and, like, get through it. And then, like, you come out the other end and you're, like, maybe I kind of, like, am an adventurer now. Yeah. Like, you know? <laughs> and then that, like, limit just, like, keeps growing and growing and growing. I think that's probably true about, like, everyone that we look up to. Yep. I think you maybe assume that, like, well, I could never do that because, like, I don't have the qualifications that, like, so-and-so has. And, like, they're super extreme and they've done all these incredible things. But, like, at some point, they were just, yeah. like, whoever also to took sometime. the plunge, figured out how to, like, do stuff for themselves. So like You probably never thought that when you first picked up a fly rod or when Chase was teaching you how to fly fish that you would, like, yeah, no. that would lead to you guys going on this two-week expedition, yeah. backcountry expedition to Labrador where, like, people have not been for yeah. hundreds yeah. of years yeah. Yeah. potentially yeah, no and i don't know it's it, it's it's really cool especially to see like the whole project go through and kind of see the process yeah. but two more things before we close yep um because we literally could talk forever <laughs> like, yeah. we're, we're, it, we're losing our light here yeah, and we I could know. we're gonna have to do another podcast whenever you guys come <laughs> yeah. back in town or if we meet up out west and fish we're gonna have to do another podcast but yeah, for sure um for for somebody who is maybe wanting to do um you know maybe wanting to do a big expedition a trip they want to maybe they're stuck or something in there they just they just want to do some sort of big fishing trip or just big trip in general um what advice would you guys have for someone who's kind of in that position like looking for that next adventure oh man i don't know um i mean i think you just gotta go yeah commit to it for sure Um, you gotta go even if you're not all the way prepared which isn't but not Isn't in a way that's advice. like not safe though. <laughs> Don't be unsafe. <laughs> um, well, you know, like I have opinions about that though. I know, I know you do. But like, like I think it's should... hard to put your safety on the line to mm-hmm. like say to like go do a trip even if you're not prepared. Prepare yourself the best you can. Maybe you're not mentally prepared, maybe you're not financially prepared. Maybe there's other situations that are a little bit scary or uncomfortable. Um, but just try to do it within, you know. Yeah. Within Do your reason. research. <laughs> Don't be unsafe and make sure you're, other make people sure you're to be taking unsafe. right. All all of that's important, and especially now these days, there's tons of new people outside who have never been into situations like this, or maybe haven't been in a long time because everyone's been cooped up inside for years. It's been a global pandemic, and also just the outdoor industry in general is exploding. So there's tons mm-hmm. of new faces in the outdoors, um, and with that comes a lot of people getting into situations they're not not ready to be able to handle, and people get hurt and all that. So make sure you got a little bit of experience under your belt. But if you sanitize something to the point where like, you know, everything so well and your safety protocol is so good, it's not an adventure anymore. So like, it's just by the nature of it. A part of the adventure is like being a little out of your comfort zone. Um, yeah. And I think you just got to like, if something's a little bit, you know, choose increments if you've never even been on like a week-long road trip maybe don't like bicycle the pan-american highway down to south america (laughs) or something you know like choose something within your range but like always push yourself push yourself out of your your comfort zone zone. and usually the biggest comfort zone is like leaving the most comfortable thing to do is to dream about a big trip and and never take it and Mm -hmm. sit on the couch and you know what we're all gonna end up dead one day so when you're facing that, staring down the barrel of reassessing or assessing your life and what you've done, I hope that people look back and think that they've, like, done a lot of the stuff they want to do and they're not full of regret. Um, and for us, that means, like, just pushing ourselves to do stuff even if even if it's not the most comfortable thing to do. So, I, yeah, I think that's yeah. my advice is, like, just go for it. Even if you're not all the way prepared, as long as you're pretty prepared, 
just go. Oops, like I left the house and I'm going on this big cross country trip and I forgot like a quarter of the stuff I wanted to bring. Too bad. Figure it out along the way. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like You'll just go for it. it out. Yeah. Cause that's the thing is if if you want something bad enough, people are all all people are so resourceful and incredible. They'll make it make it work. You know what I mean? Like society's almost like made us lose our sense of adventure and like yeah. risk because mm-hmm. everything is so set up. Yeah. And like it's life isn't easy, but mm-hmm. like it's very comfortable. You can, you can go through life and kind of cruise and yeah. coast, yeah, mm-hmm. you know, and I think like, sp- a challenges. trip like that, you know, like in a, a back country experience, wilderness experience mm-hmm. really brings out like the human element that mm-hmm. like is like kind of drilled into us from the core. Yeah. Um, it kind of like brings that out when mm-hmm. a lot of stuff in society nowadays and social media doesn't really give you that. Yeah. So, it's not, yeah, it's not popular to say like do dangerous stuff once in a while. Right, you know, because you can hurt yourself and you could cause other people harm and like none of that stuff's good. But I think it's important to have risk in your life. Try and make it calculated risk. You know, don't just throw like all caution to the wind all the time. But mm-hmm. I think risk and overcoming risk um, is incredibly important to just like building a strong person. You know, and yeah. you've and heard it from us this whole <laughs> time. Don't that, be like, afraid to suffer. Yeah, yeah. you've heard every of- like Chase notoriously loves a good suffer fest. <laughs> myself like i'm a little less excited sometimes it's a good balance but always the aftermath like after those really difficult challenges situations suffer fest there's so much growth and i feel so like it, the benefit far outweighs the the suffering I yeah guess. it's a total <laughs> it's a total cliche but it, it gives perspective to all the other stuff you know the the highs aren't the highs without the lows. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? If you never have any lows, there's nothing very high about the high. That's just yeah. baseline. You know what I mean? If you never dip down, like you need the peaks and valleys in anything in life. And it makes you so much more appreciative of everything. And like I said, it doesn't have to be like a big adventure. But if you just like go out and have like a, a hard day of like hiking and trying to fish somewhere and you're super sweaty and you're super tired and you forgot to bring food and like you finally get home and just like take a hot shower and eat a meal. It's the best hot shower and meal you've ever had in your life. You know what I mean? And they've always been the same. That Mm -hmm. shower's always been just as glorious and like, you know, whatever food you have at home's always been just as good. You just don't have the perspective to like appreciate it, you know? So like challenging yourself and working hard at stuff allows you to see the beauty and other things in life. And like, who doesn't want that? Right. Who doesn't want their life to feel, like, more enriched? You know what I mean? And I think experiences like this are one of the, like, most guaranteed way to sort of enrich your life. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's great. And then last question would be for people who are, you know, I think fly fishing is a huge industry that's growing right now. And mm-hmm. just in the outdoor, outdoor industry is growing, but especially in fly fishing. Mm-hmm. But people that are wanting to start getting into fly fishing, like films and making films, what would you guys say would be your biggest advice for them? I, I mean, again, it's just kind of like, go for it, I guess. But Yeah, we get this question a lot. People write us. One, yeah. they, they assume that they we're assume like... They assume that we make a living. We're making a, a <laughs> killing making these videos, and they're like, I don't want to do what you yeah, guys do. How do you do true. it? And yeah. I have to break it to them that like we're kind of struggling. But, yeah, you know, we're winging not, it all the time. Yeah. But um, if you love it, if you truly love it, I think if you just push and work hard at it yeah i think the important thing is like just to go out and shoot because there's so much great content so many great filmmakers and people see the finished product and of course immediately you want to be able to emulate that people see a wildfly video and they're like i want to make videos that look like this how do i get there and you're immediately dying what camera do i need like all this kind of stuff and don't get me wrong i'm all for the tools being the tools that they are they they certainly add something (laughs) um but the most important thing, because none of us came out fully formed. We got there through the process, and there's really no beating that the system. Well, like, yeah, you no, got to push no to go to get through good. it. Yeah, there's so. no shortcuts. So, like, whatever you can afford, buy it, even if it's just your phone, and just go out and start shooting, and like, shoot stuff on your phone and edit it, and like, make a video. It doesn't matter if the video sucks. Make the video because the next one's gonna be better. And eventually, if you keep doing that stuff, you're gonna get to whatever point you want to get. And no one will ever get. Don't, none of us will ever be at a point where we're like this is perfect we've right. made the perfect film we can stop now we're always going to be looking at what to do better but people I think it's yeah it's intimidating especially like in general the level of content that you see in the outdoor and the fly fishing world yeah. is like all really high level stuff 
Um, it wasn't true when we started making videos, but it's certainly true now. The film tours and all this stuff, there's like tons of like really polished, and there's a lot of people because the industry is growing. Filmmakers who are great filmmakers in their own right, who maybe never made fishing content, are getting into making fishing content because it's a popular thing to make. So you see some incredible work being done that's like, mm -hmm. you know, real deal movies you expect to see anywhere on the big screen and people are turning their attention to fishing and then you look at that and you're like how could somebody who's just got a <laughs> yeah. gopro it's like how could i ever make something yeah like this um you know but the truth is behind every one of those films is just some person or group of people who've made a thousand films before that working through the same issues and that the you first one sucked are, yeah you so know? you gotta you gotta just go out and do it you know i think that's the key and it doesn't it's hard. I think we're we're accustomed to wanting to sort of like skip the process um, these days. We're kind of an instant gratification culture. You know, I'm not trying to get like yeah. too curmudgeon -y here, but mo most of life is, especially with social media, is kind of an instant gratification culture. So mm -hmm. it's hard to look at like all the work up front it would take to get good at stuff. And you know, that's what I tell that's what I tell people when they reach out to us. But also, yeah, I don't know if you we're so connected now more than ever if there's someone's work that you really admire and you're trying to figure out get an insight into how they got where they got you just shoot them an email or a dm and those people can probably help fast track you but i imagine they're all gonna have similar stories yeah. um to what i'm saying which is just got to get out there and shoot and you'll learn you'll learn best from your own mistakes yep absolutely I, you know what i mean i don't know that i could tell anyone like don't do this whatever you do yeah. don't do this and they'll you, know, you have like to help mess them. up yeah. like constantly like each each trip you go and you have to just mess up and be like mm -hmm. Gosh, there's going to be like triumphs and there's going to be failures and learning from those things. And, one one yeah. thing I would say to someone who's trying to get into fishing filmmaking now, though, and we were talking about this earlier, every angler has sort of had to go through their own journey in terms of like fish ethics and how you handle fish and how mm -hmm. you treat fish as a wild resource. And I think the whole culture in general is so much more evolved now than like when I started fishing where you know, throwing a fish up on the bank to like take a picture of it at your feet with your boot for a comparison to length was like the norm. Yeah, That's yeah, like yeah. not acceptable anymore. And for good reason. Um, I think if you're getting into filmmaking, it's very hard to get a wild animal to cooperate on camera the way you want it to. So if you have a vision mm -hmm. for like this perfect shot of this fish, you know, this hero shot you want to get or whatever, and the fish isn't cooperating, you just have to, um, you have to be respectful of that resource because, you can just kill fish for the, and none of it's worth like whatever shot, you know? So yeah, that can be really frustrating. You learn techniques. We all have gotten really good. Even just today, like fishing with you, we didn't even like really talk about like, we're shooting some photos and a little bit of video. And like, if we catch a fish, what are we going to do? How are we going to set up? But like, we all kind of had the same beats yeah. where like everyone kind of knows, like <laughs> everyone just falls into the place where it's like, this is how long you can handle a fish for. And like, yeah. This is when like the camera is going to be on. And like, yeah. like, you know, you've got a certain amount of time yeah. before you need to release that fish and, Keep it in and the keeping it in the water. We've and, learned all that stuff kind of the hard way of like poor fish handling skills. And everyone together in the whole community is kind of like all keeping wet mm -hmm. movement. All this stuff is all sort of like moving. And we can watch our old videos and be like, ooh, I kind of held that fish out of the water for like a yeah. long time. Right. That's not such a good look now than where it maybe didn't seem that way before. But yeah, for new people getting into it is like, if what you're passionate about is fish and you're trying to like make something out of fishing videos, just like respect the fish first and foremost. Cause as I said at the very beginning, none of those fish want to be caught. So like, <laughs> right. it's a privilege that we get to fish at all and that we're able to like do what we do. So like no fish is worth the shot. So try and keep fish in the water and be quick with the camera and be, be ready and know what you're going to do when you like land a fish to yeah. be able to do yeah. that stuff. Cause yeah, that's, that's definitely a bummer if more people are getting into filmmaking and just, like, killing fish left and right, mm -hmm. handling them rough and out of the water for a long time because it's hard to get the shot. And the truth is, like, we just, like, miss a lot of shots. Yep. You know? Fish is ready to go. Like, fish is going. Like, we just you just might end up missing it. Um, fish, you know, jumps out of the net, you didn't get the shot, yep. move on. Yeah. Like, it's, yeah. it's okay. Whereas, yeah. like, a decade ago, I might have just, like, strangled that fish into submission <laughs> yeah. to like, get my photo or whatever, <laughs> you know? We've all learned... <laughs> Yeah. yeah, to be better uh, people with that stuff. So yeah, that, I, that's I, advice you can give that can kind of fast track people in the right direction for sure. Yeah, that's great. I think, you know, something that we can both say is like, by no means have we made it. And there's, no. you know, we're we're growing and learning every single day. Mm -hmm. But I think we all we were all at a point where we didn't really know what we were doing, mm -hmm. you know, and that we see all these like films out there. And we're like, gosh, like, where do I fit mm -hmm. in? Like, how am I going to fit into something mm -hmm. that people were, would spend their time watching. And I think everyone might feel like they're at that position, but like 
it just takes time, like you were saying, and just know that we were there and uh, you can get to wherever you want if you really, you know, put the time and effort into it and just learn from your mistakes, like you guys are saying. And yeah, no, it's, it's great. Um, I, I really appreciate you guys. We could literally talk forever. This is, this has been great. <laughs> um, I appreciate you guys making it out here and uh, getting to do podcasts and almost be dark here in the, yeah. in the woods. Yeah. But, yeah thanks um, so much for showing us around. Thanks for the opportunity. First ever podcast with yeah. tight loops. There's been lots of people who have asked, have you guys ever been on a podcast? Love to hear you like talking about this and that. Um, yeah. So I'm excited that people will get to see it and, yeah, it couldn't have been a better one as far as I'm concerned. Really appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Could give them like a little snippet about our next. Yeah, I was gonna yeah, I was gonna say oh. like what without like spoiling too much, what should people expect about what's coming from you guys in the future here? We've spent the last year, year and a half, basically the whole pandemic leading up until this point, working real hard on a video series and we've never we kind of had a, a couple series-esque things in the past but this is going to be a long form series with multiple seasons and each season will be 10 plus episodes um lots and lots and lots of content um it's all it's about all the kind of stuff that people who i think follow us have kind of come to know that we're interested in and they're following along for the same reason um adventure travel wild fish native fish fish conservation um natural world all that kind of stuff i don't want to give too much of it away yet mm. but um we're, we're hoping to finally be like a little more consistent with our posting on YouTube. Cause anyone who follows us on YouTube knows that, um, we try and post like the best stuff we can, but it's pretty intermittent. Um, and this stuff will still take us a long time to edit, but it should start rolling out very soon. I don't know when this will be on whatever, but yeah. probably by yeah, the like time it is, yeah, yeah, there will be, be an announcement for a date for the first episode shortly thereafter, or it might already be out and you can go check it out just go to our youtube channel and we'll yeah that's how yeah and the fact that you guys have been living we could have talked about this also oh my god yeah we, we <laughs> yeah. live full time in in the rust bucket in behind, what you us. See behind them. <laughs> yeah yeah so yeah. we've been living traveling and producing this series entirely from the road full time everyone's familiar who's familiar with us knows this van because we yeah. used to do shorter trips um mm -hmm. in it but now it's all, that's it. We don't have any apartment. That we can, now. Yeah, we don't have any apartment <laughs> we can go back to or whatever. We're in this it's for Chase's the foreseeable mobile painting studio. Yeah. yeah, we also have a cat that lives with us. It's not yeah. with us right now. Yeah, it's the foreseeable future is all going to be in this van. So if people are interested in van and travel content, there's plenty of that coming too. Yeah, sweet. I'm stoked. I, I can't wait to see it. And if any of you guys who are watching or listening, um, if you haven't seen Big Land or if you haven't seen any Tight Loops films, please go over to their YouTube channel. Uh, tight, it's just Tight Loops, right? Tight Loops Fly. Or... I think it's just Tight Loops. Just look on YouTube. It's just Tight yeah. Loops. The yeah. only Man, place where it's just that. Tight Loops. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, if you type in like Tight, tight Loops, loops Fly Fishing or anything you'll, like that, you'll know. YouTube.com slash yeah. Tight Loops. Yeah. But Big Land, seriously, dude, like one of the, probably the best fly fishing film I've seen um, that in Eastern Rises, but like y'all's as of late is just like it was awesome. So um, it's really Thanks, cool to, to hear to hear more about the behind the scenes. And I yeah, hope people who have seen the film, <laughs> yeah, people who have seen the film or are gonna go see it. I think it's a cool look into yeah. kind of what went, went on. Oh, um, sure. Yeah, go check them out. Uh, lots of big stuff coming. I have no doubt that you guys are gonna continue to to blow up and be a huge name in the the fly fishing film world so thanks we can ride the coattails of wild fly baby yeah. <laughs> straight to the top maybe we'll collab in the future yeah. we'll see yeah, yeah for sure yeah i hope so um cool we'll appreciate you guys listening and uh we'll see you all next one yeah thanks everybody bye